Thanks, everyone. So we um, have only a couple of things officially on our. Can you hear me okay? No, oh, a little louder. Oh, okay. We will try to things. to make sure mm -hmm. everyone. How's that? Can you hear? Oh, okay. Oh, I can. I can kind of hear can. it back there. That's good. All right. So we only have a couple of items uh, officially on our agenda tonight. Um, start with the uh, the begging ordinance repeal, and then move on to the parking garage. And I'll speak a little bit more about that when we get there. Uh, but uh, so, so, is there any other things that people want to add to the agenda? Move around? No. Okay. Great. So without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. So this is a time for anyone from the public to come speak to the council uh, regarding some item that is not on our agenda. And if you have anything you'd like to say, if you would say your name, um, uh, where you're from, and try to keep your comments to about two minutes. I got one topic not on the agenda. Uh, in, what, in your name? Stephen Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, the last, since the new paving was done, the crosswalks have were not set at the proper grade, and the water and the ice is standing in the crosswalks at State and Taylor, uh, State and Elm, et cetera. I've taken photos. I've mentioned these to Bill. Uh, but apparently they were supposed to get regraded so that the water would drain to the drains, and I thought that was going to happen long since by now, but we're heading into another winter. and the. This, the water piling up in the crosswalk turns to ice right where people are trying to cross in traffic, and that's just a dangerous... So, I'm sorry, what is... Um, you're saying that the, the grade of what now is? The, the grade of the... the elevation sidewalks? of the drains... The elevation of the drains is, is not... often an inch higher than the elevation where the crosswalk is. So we got standing water and ice and freezing in the walkways because the paving wasn't done properly. And I tried to get it moving while it was still under warranty, mm -hmm. so to speak, and it didn't get corrected, and it's still not corrected. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, we will look into that. Um, any other thoughts, comments? Okay, uh, moving on. Um, so uh, last time we uh, had the first public hearing for the repeal of uh, a begging ordinance. And so uh, tonight is the second public hearing for that. So we're, I'm going to start by uh, opening the public hearing. So uh, if anyone from the public has any comments on the repeal of the begging ordinance, now is the, a good time to do that. OK, seeing none, any comments from the council? Super duper. Um, so let me, uh, so I'm going to officially close the public hearing. And I think we probably, do we need a vote? We need a yes. vote yes. on this. Um, I, I move uh, <coughs> we amend the city ordinances to repeal section 11-708. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you, Rosie. <laughs> uh, uh, great, and because it was unanimous, we don't have to take a uh, roll call vote. So um, it's approved. Thank you, everyone. I am very, <laughs> very glad to have that off of our books. Okay. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so moving on to talking about the proposed uh, parking garage uh, structure. So there's a couple of things that um, are going to be the focus of the conversation tonight. Um, one is about the structure, um, and then the other, I think, is about the facade, more or less. Um, I want to just be clear that things that uh, we're generally not debating tonight is uh, where, uh, like, is this the right location? We're talking about this location. Um, and uh, other, other things might include, like, whether or not we're going to, you know, include it on the ballot. That's not the conversation for tonight. This is about what, um, what uh, you know, would be in a permit uh, application for, um, you know, an upcoming approval um, with the DRB and DRC. Uh, so uh, having said that, uh, there's, well, so one possibility is that I can just turn it over to you all 
uh, and then we can. Uh, so the the order in which I'd like to talk about things is um, one. I mean, there, there's uh, some discussion, or there's been some comments from the public about uh, some some pretty uh, hefty ideas, right? Like, should we have a roof? Um, what if there was a pool? What if there were tennis courts? You know, that that kind of thing. I'd like to discuss that kind of thing first. Anything that might require. Um, uh, substantial extra funding, um, and then um, secondly, we'll go on from there to talking about the structure, and then after that, the facade. Um, does that sound okay, team? You okay with that as an order? Okay, great. Does that jive with what you had understood? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. Um, first of all, like to introduce Greg Rabideau, uh, Rabideau I think I, to everyone who's met, you might want to introduce yourselves. I, I'll start. Uh, sure. My name is Glenn Hutchison. I'm the city councilor from District 3. Good to meet you, Greg. Good to meet you. Donna Bate, District 1. Uh, Ashley Hill, District 3. Ann Watson, Mayor. Yeah. Hi, Greg. Jack McCullough from District 2. Jack. And on the phone? Rosie Kruger, District 1. And Connor Casey is not with us. Um, for folks that are out there, we set it up in this fashion tonight so that we could have a work session. We hope that you can hear. There are some copies of the plans out, but there, I think the idea is to have Greg do a brief presentation about um, the proposal and then have questions and answers and comments from people in about the topics as the mayor outlined. So, we have one. This is a yeah. mic, Greg, so if you and I can share this, okay. I think that will help people a little better. Um, um, hear us I better. I, I'm going to interject one more time. Um, just again, in thinking about the process, um, if after you're done and we have our discussion, um, I wanted I, I think it makes sense to take this piece one piece at a time. Yes. And so um, I guess I would ask the public uh, to comment specifically on the section that we're talking about, if that makes sense. So um, if we're talking about the structure and we're about to make some decisions about that, that would be the time for you all to comment about the structure. It's, uh, and then separately uh, comment on the facade as we get to that part. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was my intent. Um, I, I still can't see the video feed. I'm not seeing it on the website where the agendas are posted, and I'm not seeing it on Alex's website. So if there's any visuals, can you guys email them to me? If you go to the website and just go to agenda, within the agenda. It's not there. I, I got it there. City website? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I went to the agenda section, but I'm not finding the video feed. Okay. But don't look at the, don't, if you want to get all the printed stuff we're looking at. Although there is printed stuff we just got tonight that we don't have electronically that to send out. Hmm. Well, okay. so, yeah. so. We can maybe follow up with that. We can send it out, I assume, once we get it. But. Just so Rosie knows, there's nothing being projected on the screen here. Right. No. So what, okay. you, what you would see in the video feed is just us sitting here talking. Okay, I can picture that. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much, lots of experience. Versus the, the drawings that are closest to what we have is, are, is part of the link of the agenda, but the uh, updates aren't there yet. No, these aren't. These are new. I'm hearing, Rosie, I'm hearing that on Orca Media, the, the YouTube feed, it should now be up. Can you try looking oh, at that again? YouTube. I'm getting September 12th. So why? I have it up right here. Okay. Electronics. Yeah, it's running here. In my corner against there. Hmm. Sorry. Go. Oh. So I think Greg will just walk us through the basics of what we have in front of us so that everyone is acquainted with that and then we can go into the discussions. Thank you for your time. I'm, I'm pleased to be here tonight. I'm sorry to give you a bunch of paperwork just at the beginning of the meeting, but um, I, I want to assure you the substantive part of our discussion regarding which form of the structure we, we want to work with, that was transmitted earlier today. Everything will be available first thing in the morning tomorrow for you um, as well online. Uh, what I've presented to you is a little list of uh, discussion points about the garage, I'm trying to sweep up all the various threads of conversation that I've heard between city staff, input from the public, adjoin adjacent property owners. So I've got some bullet points in this cover letter, um, but the uh, the very front part of it is is our primary charge tonight, which is we are going to evaluate 
a few different forms that the garage can take in terms of its internal functional relationships and selecting one of those to move forward for development into a full application to the Design Advisory Committee and the Development Review Board, uh, which our current schedule calls for us to do during the, the, to have those hearings during the month of October. Um, I also uh, was um, brought along some additional supporting information to help people understand some specific aspects of the project, some photographs of other places where people have used green walls, for instance, and um, we took the time to colorize the elevations that were submitted earlier. So nothing uh, sort of totally new here, uh, but at the same time a little graphically easier to understand, and hopefully that will facilitate tonight's discussion. Um, I'll briefly orient everyone to the project. Um, those of you who, are, who um, are looking at a plan, uh, this is State Street. This is Taylor Street. This large gray blob here is the original Capitol Plaza Hotel and Conference Center. Um, there's a portion of Christ Church Episcopal shown here, and there's a, there's a small uh, garage building, people call it, is located here. Those are existing structures. This form right here is the previously approved 84-room Hampton Inn and Suites, which is uh, um, was approved earlier this year. And uh, when it was, a, a smaller version of this parking garage was also approved with it. Now comes the city who's, who's interested in developing a, a, a parking garage with a broader purpose. And so we are presenting to you tonight uh, a larger garage footprint that occupies a, about a half acre of land shown subdivided here, which would be, uh, I understand, gifted from the Hampton Inn to the city for purposes of providing space to build this parking garage. The parking garage overlaps onto the land of uh, Mary Heaney, who, uh, which is subject to a long-term lease belonging to the city. So the entire length of the parking garage is roughly uh, 216 feet, I believe. Uh, it is also uh, about 115 feet wide. As we evaluate different ways of putting a garage on this site, different internal circulation patterns, um, we, uh, we should take for granted that, that all the footprints would be the same. There's no real change in the site planning associated with the various options. So you should feel free to, to decide without concern that one of them's wider or something like that, even if our schematic drawings and stuff, uh, you know, haven't all sort of caught up with each other. But we've only been on a case for a couple of weeks here, so we've produced a lot of information in the last few weeks. Um, so other pertinent fe uh, features that we want to keep track of moving forward, of course, the relationship of this project to the original Hampton Inn project, but also its relationship to Christ Church Episcopal and its impact on the Haney lot and the farmer's market that uses it. Um, the city has already in process a plan to develop a bike path. There's a pedestrian uh, bike path bridge. It's immediately adjacent to the bowstring bridge that, uh, that the Vermont Central Railroad uses. Um, that bike path uh, carves through a corner of the property, crosses the tracks, and ends up going off to Taylor Street. So um, one of the things that we have to deal with moving forward is, is integrating that feature into the plans for this project. So we've been working on that since the uh, original approval process, um, but it's still a part of this. Pedestrian access to this garage would be the same in all the schemes. Uh, the primary access to the parking garage is here via a uh, dedicated right-of-way or easement. We're still waiting for legal opinion as to which form that should take, uh, but that the uh, easement would deliver cars to a point here where there's an elevator lobby and one of the two sets of emergency stairs. Then uh, cars would drive around in here. In addition to that, there are pedestrian accesses from the, uh, from the other emergency stair out to the bike path, and there's a pedestrian and potentially secondary vehicle access accessing the, the remainder of the, the Haney lot on the north side of the building. Um, what will happen is that uh, depending on the form of the garage, you know, some of them will slope different ways. The, 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 var the various solutions may have different heights, and we'll discuss that because those will, those will be among some of the pros and cons. Um, but uh, 
the charge was to come up with at least 348 parking spaces. Um, at least one of the schemes produ produced a few more spaces than that, as many as 367. Um, we're going to explore whether or not that's a good idea, but uh, that is um, uh, that, that's the basic problem we're trying to solve and the sort of lay of the land and the context uh, for it. Um, I, I want to just go through quickly some of the bullet points on the last page of the transmittal letter. I don't think you need to read along, but uh, essentially um, just to explain uh, that this, the outside facade of the building we'll talk about later when it's appropriate. Um, but there are certain features that we know for sure will be incorporated into the design, and I would like to just put those on the table so that people can focus on things that maybe haven't been committed to yet. Certainly, number one is the garage will incorporate electrical vehicle charging stations. We don't know how many yet because we're waiting for our traffic consultants and our parking garage consultants to explain to us what, uh, what data sets are out there to measure how many are appropriate. Uh, so, uh, but, I, but I do believe that initially we'll have some, and then we will provide in the design the capacity to add more as, as, electro, as electric cars, chargeable cars, uh, become more and more prevalent. Um, that will mean we'll probably provide for additional blank spaces in our panels, our circuit panels, and additional conduit to, to various locations to uh, accommodate addition, you know, uh, plugging in additional elements as we go. We also uh, will illustrate in the plans that are submitted for approval storage for bicycles. There are many places in the plans, depending on which version is picked, where it's a sort of dead space created by the intersection of two 90-degree spaces. Um, so we assume that we'll provide some kind of lockable bike storage in the garage, hopefully, uh, you know, at various levels. Um, I know that uh, when we developed the hotel plans, there was thought about providing some kind of uh, uh, free lease kind of bike situations analogous to New York City bike program, that the um, at least the hotel is interested in having some bikes for hire in some form or another, uh, because the bike path is right there. Um, so uh, the garage, uh, these, are, these are sort of just bullet points, but the garage will have a full sprinkler system in it. It will have a security system in it, which will have cameras in the stairwells, at the entrances and exits, and um, at certain key points along the building perimeter, most especially on the south side by the bike park, pack, path and adjacent to those bridges, um, which uh, my understanding is that the, those cameras will be monitored at Montpelier PD. Um, via, via a uh, sort of interlake, internet based camera link. Um, the uh, team is also evaluating the use of the district heat system to do some snow melting. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know if that's been committed, but a, a, a commitment to explore it and to sort of understand how it could be integrated into the project is underway. Um, Can I ask you about some of these things? Yes. I'm, I'm assuming you're interruptible. Jumped in, jump in okay. any time, yeah. Um, uh, I just want to check in before we move on too quickly. I mean, about the cameras, um, I'm thinking about the storage of the data. Has that been uh, incorporated into the, the cost of that? Or is it just, because I, I assume you'd need some data storage. Well, we, we just today met with uh, a, uh, our, one of our team members who is going to be involved in the electronic aspects of this thing, the gates and, uh, the, you know, the ticket system and all of that. Um, they tell us that the project will require some kind of server room for managing all of that. Oh, okay. So I imagine it's just a question of putting another blade into the rack as far as being able to provide data storage. But we're going to have a live internet connection to this location okay. and an air-conditioned room for all the equipment that runs the parking garage. And I assume the, the uh, security system can be integrated into that. Thank you. Um, so uh, just generally speaking, uh, the, uh, the project is uh, designed for drainage. We're going to have a couple of different kinds of things going on here in terms of stormwater. I know you don't care about that, but I think the <laughs> yeah, public... Yeah, we do. Stormwater is a big issue. <laughs> so so let, me, let me just pause on that for a moment then, that the water will be collected from each level. There is likely going to be a, a series of large diameter baffles underneath the slab for the sort of temporary retention of that water, uh, allow settling of solids, cooling, anything that might need to happen to that water. It'll also have to go through an oil and grit separator so that anything that drips off of cars or anything won't end up in the stormwater. 
and then ultimately, after it goes through all those systems, it will discharge via a, a, a conduit that's going to be built into the head wall of the bike path and discharge into the uh, north branch of the Winooski River. But that'll be uh, sort of treated to a secondary level or whatever by the systems in the building. Uh, as far as flood goes, um, the best way I can explain this is that, the, that we're going to try to design the garage in a way that's volume neutral. So that even though the, there's a building here, um, we're going to provide for volume that's not parking level volume, it's just, it's just storage volume so that, it, so that we essentially, in putting this garage here, we end up with sort of no net change in the uh, sort of amount of capacity of this piece of land to deal with storm water. So water would flow in on the east and portions of the north and south side, there'll be, there'll be openings where it can flow back out again uninterrupted. So in the, wor in the worst case scenario, if there was a flood, this, this building would be uh, resilient to withstand that, but it would also, it wouldn't be contributing to any loss of volume. Um, there'll be some additional pieces of that that we'll, we'll deal with when we come through the public hearing process for approvals to modify the uh, hotel plans to do similar things. I just want to make sure I understand that. So by loss of volume, you mean the capacity of that area to take volume of, a volume of water? Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. It, uh, during an inunda inundation, um, there's space, non-parking space, uh, that, that that is uh, designed to uh, to sort of absorb that flow, and then when it retreats, it's allowed to retreat out naturally without any pumps or anything like that. And it wouldn't impact parked cars. It's it's just sort of we're using the footprint of the garage to make that happen. So uh, I know it's a concern of people, and that's why I wanted to mention it. Um, so those are, those are my brief bullet points, and um, and so I think uh, with that said, I'll let you move into your section about the, the sort of other articles. Uh, I, I, I may have skipped over one of these because I did want to mention that we are exploring the use of, or the, um, the addition of solar panels to the top of the building. What I can tell you with, with certainty is that the... Uh, building structure will be designed to handle any extra load that that might entail. Um, beyond that, I think that's a, a city decision as to whether or not to implement that as a part of this, but the project will be designed to accommodate it either during the first construction or at some point in the future. Uh, and uh, before we get into the specifics about the alternatives, could you tell us how, what the distance is between the garage and the hotel? and the river and back? Okay. Um, our goal is to try to create a, a 10 foot wide space between the garage and the hotel. To, okay. So it would be an imaginary property line sort of splitting right down the middle with five feet on either side of it. Um, that's a magic number for us in terms of uh, fire code issues and the uh, ability to have openings and walls and things like that. But it, it also feels like sort of, sort of the minimum amount of space that we can do because that's a, that's a major corridor from State Street down to the bike path. Yeah, just before our meeting, I was talking to a constituent who said she really wants to have that design so it's attractive enough that people will want to ride their bikes or walk back through there yeah. to get to the bike path because... You know, having it just a, a dark uh, kind of forbidding tunnel, it's not the best uh, best thing. Yeah, it's well, it's you know, it's going to feel like an alley in some ways. You'll have buildings on either side. The, the design of the hotel and the design of the garage are intended to be nice materials. It's not like it's not like there's an ugly side to the to the building. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, that's that's that and, and appropriate paving and landscaping. Uh, the other thing is that that overlap is is you know, the building, the hotel building necks in a lot so that, that the duration of that narrowness is fairly short, about 50 feet. It's the green space. Yeah. It looks brown here, but it's green right. space. But the other question I was thinking of was this, the green space or open space between the hotel and the garage and the river. What's back, what's behind the hotel and the, and the garage and then? So the buildings, the buildings meet the uh, southerly property boundary at a kind of uh, acute angle. So what, you know what you're going to get all the way along the project are sort of big triangles of space. You know, up here it's mostly vegetation. Uh, immediately adjacent to the hotel, there's some social spaces. Then there's another band of vegetation. And right now, our thinking has been that we would create some kind of little like park-like setting here that would include things like uh, permanently mounted bike tool racks. 
um, Wagner Hodgson, who are our landscape architects, have proposed uh, granite blocks emerging at different elevations from the topography so that people can sit on them and climb on them and add some visual interest. And then again, right before we cross the river, this turns into additional landscaping. Um, down in here, this is another landowner, so far as I know, and there, our landscape architects thought that there might be some effort going on to maybe put parkland in here, although I, I, I don't know about that. Over here. I think that that's what I thought it was on this side. So, um, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, this space in here is meant to not be the back side of the building, but sort of the front facade as it faces Memorial Drive. Mm -hmm. So we're using the same quality materials. All of that is the same. Um, you know, this this will develop over time, but uh, but that that's our thought process. So I want to observe that uh, just a few meetings ago, we created something called Confluence Park, which is quite small, but it's it's right here at the corner of the North Branch in the Winooski. And so um, one hypothesis is that, I mean, you, you just mentioned like putting in some cement blocks up here. Well, granite slabs. I granite, mean. Granite, Sorry, granite. Oh, that's what it was. Granite, granite slabs. Granite. Granite. Yeah. <laughs> I translated that to something else. But um, uh, I guess my thought is, you know, we're, so we're going through a process with the rest of Confluence Park to think about what could or should be done with that space. And, you know, uh, it, it seems logical to me that we would want to include that portion um, of planning or design in with that um, th the rest of that planning process so you know again part of me would I, I'm sure this is not necessarily um, something we need to spend a lot of time on but I mean I would be inclined to like just hold off on any granite a any installations at that point to let that process unfold and include this part of the the world be a part of that design thoughts I just don't know when the park's going to happen. So oh. it would be in limbo. I just want it be attractive. And granite slabs are, or any kind of uh, staggered uh, seating, it's also climbable, something mm -hmm. that's inviting it but not hard to change. Uh, so that would be fair. my problem. And just for reference for everybody, the, the Confluence Park, here's the, you can sort of faintly see the outline of the bike path. Mm -hmm. So that's all. It would really be all this area in here, and, and we're, we've redu we're reducing six parking spaces. I don't know if you've got those yet or not. So there will be some green on this side of the bike path as well. Um, and I think to Jack's question about what these things back up to, the, the hotel actually backs up to, the, this is all the rail line. So the, 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 these park areas will be bisected by the rail line and the rail bridge. So the hotel backs up to the rail line and then the one Taylor project, which is here's the transit center and the one Taylor building. This will also back up to the parking and the spot. So the closest to the river this would be would be right in this area here where our bike path and new bridge is crossing. Yeah. I, I want to check in on that corner um, because I heard you say that uh, there is pedestrian uh, exit there in the emergency stairwell. Um, or something like that? Well, yeah, I mean, we have fire stairs at each fire corner stairs. of the garage, but there's a there's a, a small, like, vestibule lobby type thing, and ours, our intention is to have a door here or something. Yeah, and uh, being a person who has opened the, the alarm door in a parking garage before and had it go off unintentionally, um, is that going to be an alarm door, or is that a door that people can just walk out straight to the park? I, I don't think it needs to have an alarm on it. I mean, it certainly does, it's not required by code. It's really, yeah. I, I, think, I, I, I think our first line of defense would be to have the, the monitoring going on. Yeah. Now, if operationally over time you find, you know, that people are sleeping in those stairwells or something like that, then you might have to come up with a solution. But, um, you know, that's, that's for you to decide in terms of how you operate it. Uh, there's no code ri reason to compel that. Okay, yeah. Um, before we move too far off, uh, any other thoughts on, um, I mean, I, my inclination is going to be to want to include this bit in Confluence Park once we get to that point. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. Even though, even if we have to move some stones? Yeah. It's, I agree. I think you're probably right that moving some granite stones there is probably not that difficult. 
Well, I'll, I'll throw up one thing that, that we will probably have to illustrate something in order to satisfy the submittal requirements for our planning and zoning permit. Okay. But the city is the client here, and you can elect to not construct that until you've until the rest of the thing comes together. Or we could, you know, if there, at some point in the future there's a happy moment where it all comes together, then we'll just come back and amend the permit. Okay, great. Thank you. I wanted to um, ask a question about the solar panels um, that was, were mentioned earlier. Um, and I just wanted to verify you're talking like a, some kind of carport awning type structure um, over the parking spaces. That's, that's our recommendation. I mean, we're going to have a talk about whether or not this thing should have a roof on it in a minute. But I, uh, um, our recommendation is that we, uh, we use commercially available systems that are already sort of it's a carport and a, and a solar panel at the same time. Uh, we estimate about 12 kilowatt hour capacity would be enough to light the structure completely. And, and that's achievable, I think, with, uh, you know, with a 5,000 kilowatt system, um, or a 5,000 watt system. Uh, we, I, it's reasonable to think that we could operate the lighting for the garage using that. I, I understand that the city's up against their max in terms of net metering. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other option might be to just create the electricity, store it, and use it on site. And uh, I don't believe we could get enough solar energy to run the elevator reliably. But with, with contemporary LED lighting, I think we could get that done, and that might be the, the way to go. Um, one other suggestion we'd make from a visual analysis point of view is that we, to the extent that we provide that, that we bring it in from the edges of the building so it doesn't sort of create a de facto fifth floor. Um, but. But uh, yeah, we, we've put a, a good deal of thought into solar on this. It's just a question of budgeting, and we can talk about that when we talk about solar and the electrical vehicle stations. This, the city, if the city doesn't have the capital to put that into their capital budget, then there might be vendors who would be willing to put that in and lease it back to the city or to, uh, in the case of the EV stations, they put them in, and then they get a small charge every time somebody charges the, uh, their car. Mm -hmm. So um, there are arrangements for some of these pieces of equipment that don't, that don't end up necessarily turning into capital expenses. But, but we want to make sure that the building is capable to, to receive these things. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Rosie? No, yeah, that's great, thanks. OK. Any other things on stuff so far? Okay, so uh, to uh, switch the conversation to talking about, um, I think mostly the, the top, the roof, um, I, I just want to frame this in the sense that uh, what, what we have been talking about so far is a 10, 10 and a half uh, million dollar bond. And anything that really takes us out of that, I think, should be separate. So if we're going to consider anything um, that's uh, you know, outside of um, contingencies, basically, that that would need to be its own bond. Um, so, um, so if we were going to put a roof, you would separate that as a separate bond to put a roof on it. Right. That's a good idea. Yeah. I'm just, just saying that that's um, what I think we would be talking about there. Um, and, I, and Glenn, I know you had some thoughts on this. Do you want to kick us off there? Sure. Uh, I, I wish I had more specific thoughts. Um, it's uh, been kind of exciting for me to think about the, the possibilities of uh, the city owning a garage. And uh, many of my friends and acquaintances have helped uh, source ideas from elsewhere. Um, some of them are uh, really amazing. For example, I saw this morning a, a design, it hasn't been built, but a design of a garage that is uh, set into uh, 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 the ground and it has a reservoir below. And as storm water uh, flows in, the garage floats up and gets higher. Um, which is amazing. Uh, I don't know that we can do that. but. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, for instance, just having a, a, a real space on the top that could be uh, potentially a park um, with some kind of uh, greenery uh, and, and some further use than just parking cars, as important as that use is, uh, I think would make this project more palatable to a certain uh, group of people, um, including me. Um, so I would say I'd, I'd love to hear uh, 
about the possibilities of making the roof structurally sound enough that we could have event space or park space or something there. Um, I'd love to hear more uh, ideas about um, other things that we could put up there. Uh, I don't have any really strong, completely developed ideas myself, and I wish I did. Um, but I do want to, to... I also want to, to try to keep this discussion open as long as possible, despite the mm -hmm. permit requirements and, and schedule and so on, because um, I do think that that's one of the um, one of the sticking points uh, for constituents that I've talked to that that uh, it would be nice to have enough time to come up with the the perfect idea that could even pay for itself and also make this not only uh, a useful parking garage but you know a a, a a draw for instance for people from all over the place go and see Montpelier's super excellent unique parking garage that has a, 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 a dog park on top or something. Um, so any way that we can kind of get that time to, to, to make that, uh, that uh, process happen, I, I would love to, to try for it. If I, if I sort of contemplated the yeah. uh, a scale of possibilities um, from sort of really probably easy and not hard to think about all the way to this is pretty substantial. I would think that it, the, the, the deciding factor would be anything that increased the overall weight of the structure beyond what it's normally designed to take. Yeah. So all the way over on the right-hand side here would be a swimming pool because if we put 50,000 gallons of water at, you know, on a fourth story, um, you know, that has implications all the way down through the structure. Uh, all the way at the other end on the easy side, you know, would be things that generally take advantage of a hardscape like a skate park or a basketball court or a tennis court. Those are things where really it would just be the sporting equipment that would be the extra cost. Um, and then somewhere in the middle would be the adaptation of, of a green roof to the, to the structure. Um, when we talk about the various forms, though, I'll circle back and tell you which ones of these I think would lend themselves to that better than others. Um, right now, uh, you know, uh, all the surfaces we have are engaged in getting us to our magic number of parking. Um, but, you know, if, if we, we, we do have some space between that 348 and that 367 to where we might be able to take a portion of it and achieve that, we just have to decide if that's worthwhile. So I would think the, the city's plan, in its planning, it should say, okay, you know, some of these things we could continue to talk about. Some of these things we need to decide now, like is a swimming pool. So I'm going to interrupt you there. I, I just want to express that I, I mean, I, I love the idea of it, but I have significant concern about the added cost that that would bring. Um, and uh, there's, uh, even with the possibility of a, a green space up there, I mean, that is something that, like, we, it, it has, uh, you know, it's a, a, a positive side, right? Like, it could be really fun. I think it would also be really difficult to patrol yeah. um, from the police perspective. Um, I think that uh, it would be... I, I think it's important for the public, actually, to understand that, you know, when we say we're looking at spending, you know, $10.5 million, that there's a plan in place for how we're going to re pay, well, how are we going to make that money back, right? That this is an invest, this is a business investment, um, and that this is, uh, you know, something that over time will, will pay for itself. And, uh, you know, if we were going to, I, I mean, something like this, even I think as a uh, you know, medium, let's say, as, as a green roof, no, green roof? That's not great, yeah, right? That's fine, yeah. Um, you know, that's still adding something, I'm going to guess between like two and three million dollars, is that a fair assessment? It's, it's going to add substantial money in terms of increased structural capacity because we got to carry the soil, yeah. but then there's the plantings and the, right. and the matrix that supports them and all that other stuff as right. well. Yeah. And there's, there's no real plan around how we would pay for that, right? And so if that is just a, you know, us saying, like, oh, we would just uh, you know, spend an extra $3 million on something, and I, I can think of a lot of things. If we were going to just spend $3 million on something, uh, you know, I'm not sure it would be that. Um, uh, anyway, so that's that's where I'm at um, with that. Other other thoughts, team? I completely agree. Okay. Yeah. I would rather take more parking off 
the streets and have more green space down on the mm. ground level and get things going there. Yeah. I mean, I get to like, how many homes could we weatherize with $3 million? These <laughs> <laughs> are my, my priorities. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I guess I would point out that the city also already has an outdoor pool at the rec fields. Um, if we're talking about adding an indoor pool, then that's an amenity we already have, but we already do have an outdoor pool. Um, so that particular one I I'm, I'm, don't really see a rationale for. I'm interested to hear more, it's sounding like you're saying that um, adding a hard space like tennis court or basketball court wouldn't add any more cost. Is that measured well, it, correctly? It, it wouldn't be nearly as extreme. It wouldn't cost $3 million to put a basketball court up there, for instance. But you'd have to put a fence around it. You'd have to get the equipment. Um, and you'd have to deal with the fact that you'd probably end up losing that many parking spaces. Right. So I think he's talking about using a top floor that we're already constructing and converting that use. I think there's a difference okay. between that and because we were told that even just adding a, a roof for covering was going to be one to one and a half million, and then because of the, the roof and the, the load, and then if you add additional uh, amenities to it, then that just goes up from there. So this would just be converting some of the parking spaces to a basketball court on the very top level or right. something, not adding another level with a basketball court on it. You know, here we could stripe it, and then if there's no carts parked there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Ashley. Um, so I guess... I think everybody knows where I stand on this project, but I have resolved that it is probably <laughs> going to go forward. Um, so I guess for me, one, I mean, for the reasons I stated last week, I have reservations about this project anyway. But if we are going to build this parking garage, and obviously it depends on a bond vote, um, I think that we need to focus on making this a net zero thing. Um, and so I, I am at least somewhat glad, and that's maybe even an overstatement, but um, that that district heat was sort of built into this. I don't think that we're using district heat to full capacity. Um, additionally, the solar panels are attractive to me. I know that we're at our net metering max or almost there. Um, but if we can generate that energy and use it to keep the parking garage going, um, I, I think that that's sort of our obligation. I, I just, I don't, I don't think that we as a council, or at least I can't as a council member say that I'm really working towards a net zero goal and then sort of talking about all these other things that are not working towards that. Um, I also want to raise the issue of um, winter parking during parking bans. And um, a couple people have asked, and I've wondered about it myself, but I have, you know, am incredibly fortunate now to live in a place where I have parking. Um, so is the parking garage, or has there been any conversation about opening that up for residents? Because I know DPW still has to plow everything. Um, and p plowing that back lot when you've got cars parked overnight is incredibly challenging. Um, and my understanding was that it was going to be a 24-hour pay garage. But if DPW is having a hard time plowing streets, and, and clearing the back parking lot overnight. Uh, and we, the taxpayers, are ultimately going to be the ones paying for this garage. Um, I'll be a TIFF. I understand that it is structured differently. But uh, it just strikes me that um, since this is something that our community is considering building uh, and would be on the hook for if the funds didn't come through, uh, it would seem that there should be some sort of greater community benefit. And I think that would potentially help DPW as well by putting everything in there. It's a covered space. Uh, it might mitigate some potential you know, uh, safety issues for motor vehicles, but also give DPW some space to, to do what they need to do in terms of snow removal, which I know has been an ongoing concern um, for the city and for residents for quite some while. So I'll just answer that question and say that we certainly have considered that this could be a place for people to park during winter parking ban. It's, um, you know, ultimately the, f the financial operation of the garage is a policy decision of the council and, and what we choose to accept for risk. So um, we haven't got it, you know, and it's not something that necessarily has to be decided in terms of a permit application and those kinds of things. But. Um, uh, you know, we'd, ha we'd have to take a look and see, you know, maybe on nights that there's a winter parking ban called, how many nights does that happen? Uh, you know, I don't know. And we'd have to look at equity issues about, you know, who's paying, who's not paying. But um, it could happen. It would have to be, I think we'd have to give it real thought and policy thought. And have to be, you know, what, know what 
gains and losses we were getting, but it's not precluded in any way. I think it would be an interesting discussion, uh, and, you know, especially if DPW was having a hard time keeping up in a blizzard, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Certainly have that conversation. Um, okay, so at this point, uh, I just want to turn it over to the public. Any thoughts, questions, comments you might have about anything we've talked about thus far? About the roof, about tennis courts, about etc. Uh, go ahead. Hi, Dan Jones from uh, Northfield Street. Something that was said before, uh, I don't. If you've not discussed the flat uh, for, uh, we have not yet talked about that. that. Not have to this go. Okay, it's, so too com it's upcoming. It's upcoming. Then I will save my question because okay. I you, I heard something you say about the cost of this okay. being within some parameters. So that's all I was. Thinking. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, oh, and while he's coming up, do you want sure. to say anything? Um, so the other, the other thing that I would like the council to consider, just in terms of the use of the garage, um, I know that this is going to eat into some of the Heaney lot where the uh, farmer's market exists. I'm wondering if there's any way if we could partner with the farmer's market to sort of figure out a way such that maybe part of the space could be used to host the farmer's market that might give us a little bit longer to also host the farmer's market outside rather than moving it inside. Um, and again, I think it's a community benefit. I, the farmer's market's always busy. There's always people there. People want to be there. Uh, and it just seems like, again, another way for us to be able to meet community needs while also offering a thing that. So again, I'll say um, we've been actively talking with the farmer's market about alternatives with the space. I think we've got some. I don't want to speak for the farmer's market. They haven't cleared all that with their board, so I don't want to say anything that they may or may not agree with. But we have some thoughts about how it might work that I think are exciting. Um, we did not talk about using the inside of the building for anything. I think it comes. it's the same um, decision matrix that we just talked about. Uh, again, it's if, if we would be... It's an operational question, and what would we be losing, and you know, from parking revenue during those times, and is that, you know, is that a value that we're making, and where we, assuming that we are not paying for this with general fund, which we're not, um, we, you know, do we have sufficient funds to to pay for this, or where would that come from if there were a strain on finances? But I mean, that could be a discussion. Good. Okay, go ahead. If you would say your name, and uh, I'm Steve Dale. Uh, I live on uh, Terrace Street in Montpelier, and uh, I'm a part of Christ Church. Um, I agree. <laughs> um, uh, we've been involved in a lengthy conversation about this project uh, starting, I guess, in December of the last year. Um, and um, I'm not here to talk about swimming pools or uh, dog parks on top, but um, uh, I, I'm gathering now might be the time to talk about the location. Uh, so we're not, uh, do you mean like on the site, like the footprint of it? Yes. Uh, so we had discussed that the footprint isn't necessarily going to, uh, that's not necessarily one of the things that we would be changing on the matrix of decisions that we have for tonight. Um, but, you know, you're here. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, we, are the, we are the neighbor that would be directly impacted by this project. Here. Um, we've been we've had particular concerns and issues since the beginning. We were in a lengthy conversation with the Bashara family uh, and with Greg um, over a extended period of time. Uh, a lot of negotiations to make sure that our interests were taken care of. Uh, as recently as two weeks ago, we were talking with Fred Bashara about finalizing a memorandum of understanding about exactly how this is all going to work, um, and then we learned uh, of the city's um, particular role at this particular time, uh, which changed a lot of things. And we had a meeting earlier today to look at the most recent plans. There are a number of things on the plan that are different, that at least this, af this afternoon when we looked at it, were different than we ended up in our previous negotiation. Uh, there are not elevations on here, so it's hard to tell what's happening with ramps going whether there's ramp going up to the front door or not, which has a huge impact on our easement and our parking. Um, 
And all those things, I'm sure, can get answered. Uh, we had a good meeting with the city. Um, but um, if we were to be asked publicly tomorrow in the city, do we support this project, we don't have enough information to know what the impact is going to be at Christchurch. We have two interests in this uh, project um, officially. There's obviously, in any faith community, there's all kinds of opinions about um, anything. But, um, <laughs> but our official position is really based on two things. Um, number one, um, we have been talking about a, a housing project, an affordable housing project for the last almost three years now. Um, it got delayed because Down Street's resources and attention was diverted to the transit center. Um, following that delay, the proposal came up with the hotel. Uh, now we've, we're switching the sort of uh, arrangement um, in terms of who's building the garage. Um, so needless to say, it's been a long uh, and tortured journey. But our, our interest is to make sure that whatever gets built doesn't preclude the construction of affordable housing. And uh, as recently as this afternoon, uh, in a in very informal conversation, and because this is all on such short notice, there's not time to have fully uh, vetted any of this, uh, there were concerns being expressed by our key partner about uh, this garage is two or three feet closer um, to Christchurch than the previous. Um, it is not clear what's happening with the entrance to the parking. There are a few other things, and uh, we need time to understand what's being proposed here before, um, and we would hope the city would want answers to those questions before deciding to forge ahead and put something on the ballot. Um, the second interest is obviously the concern about the current state of uh, Christchurch. Uh, we do have an easement, which is the same easement that will run to the parking garage. Um, to access our parking behind the church. Uh, we're concerned to make sure that um, that isn't disrupted. We're concerned to make sure that we have um, an equal amount of parking that we own. That's another whole conversation. Uh, but currently, um, we believe we have somewhere 10 or 12 spaces on our own property. The sheriffs have been very generous in letting us spill over for the last however many years. Um, but we want to make sure that the result of this project doesn't end up with fewer parking spaces, and we would uh, we began a discussion with the city about what that would look like. That was in the MOU that we didn't quite complete with the Bashara family, but we need time to make sure that in fact this doesn't get built, um, strand us with no parking, and we get into some kind of legal tangles about it, which wouldn't be in anybody's best interest. So. Um, the other thing is stormwater. Um, we had spent a lot of time with the Bacheras and, and with mm -hmm. Greg about making sure that we're not going to end up with a lake. Um, if you look at that little spot there, it's easy to talk about the, the garage, but just look at that little white low spot there. Um, <clears throat> if it's not properly managed, um, as you know, we have a fairly fragile 150-year-old historic structure that um, brings great enhancement to the city. Um, and. Um, uh, we are very concerned that this project not compromise that building or um, its operation. So those things need to be resolved. Um, they probably can be resolved, but this is really fast, and we're starting a new discussion with a new party. And uh, uh, we just wanted to put that on the table tonight, and we will continue to work with folks over the next couple of weeks, but we want you to be aware of the, the fact that they're not resolved. So I want to just start by thanking you for coming to express all of that. Um, my, my guess is that we can't actually answer all those questions tonight, uh, but I know, um, you know housing is a priority of the council, and, uh, and I, I think we, I can say that we're committed to, to working with you um, and to figuring out some of these, these pieces, and that for the um, correct me if I'm speaking out of turn at all here, but um, I think for the application, some of the things that you're asking about maybe don't, um, they're, they're not necessarily for what we need for the application, but I could be wrong. What do you? So uh, yeah. I'll talk generally. I'll let Greg specifically address the drainage and those mm -hmm. kind of issues. So we did have a meeting. They did give us a copy of the draft MOU. I think the commitment I made, I don't think I was too far apart, was that we would honor uh, whatever terms that were, were in that, that we, we could. Um, specifically, we, I think it's fair that we would hold, keep them whole, that they don't lose their parking, and it's certainly we don't want to... Um, drain out their, 
project, nor are we allowed to legally anyway to, to do that so that we would provide whatever plans and work with them and their designers uh, as aggressively as necessary to make that happen. And that um, it is our goal to, to make the housing. And I, you know, we did hear that the proximity of the structure was a problem and it, it may be that it would have been a problem anyway if whether it was the city or not so we're trying you know I don't know if we're going to actually get a anyone's going to get an answer that says you can or can't go ahead because of other not because of the church or us it's because of external funding and those kinds of things but it's certainly everyone's desire to make this we we talked about building a connection between the two and designing that in and those kinds of things so I think you know we are looking forward to making it work great yeah. I just want to ask a couple of clarifying questions. So um, we need to have those questions resolved by 10-3 because that's when we put the bond language forward. Is that? Not necessarily. Well, I, I probably yeah, can help you. And I, <laughs> first of all, Steve, thanks for coming tonight. Well, hold, 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 I, I'm, I guess I'm just well, a, You might be able to answer your question. Well, I, my question was just a, what what exactly is the language that we need to have when we warn the election? Well, the, the, the language is going to be to approve a bond for X number of dollars. It will mention the funding sources and it will describe the project <coughs> in general terms, period. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so it's uh, just a general It's approval. an authorization to float a bond in that amount of money from these revenue sources. Okay, so... It won't be, I bet. Okay. Typically, people are going to want to see what it looks like and get a general idea of these things, And mm -hmm. but I, you know... It's not carved in stone. And you don't have to actually authorize going ahead with it, even if the bond passes, right. issues aren't resolved. But or those questions would need to be resolved before permits... Well, they would be typically resolved as part of the permitting process, and right. we want to, you know... So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but in theory, the permits could be approved not addressing some of those concerns. I doubt that. I doubt that, honestly. But in um, theory. But let me just interject a little bit because I want to put everybody's uh, at ease a little bit. Um, Steve, I, I hope Bill and Sue will back me up on this that as we've gone through this process, I have continued to advocate for the things that we discussed and agreed to. Um, the uh, only the changes in the sort of relationship of the building to the parking garage are a reflection of the fact that it's gotten bigger, but it's also a reflection of the fact that the zoning ordinance has changed, and now the dimensions that we need to observe have changed. And so this parking garage has been designed to the 2018 regs, and the net result of that, given the, the spaces and the driveline widths, is that we went from 10 feet to 7 feet 9, or essentially we lost a couple feet in width of the building. but. Uh, it's still a substantial green buffer on the south side of that pro common property line to, uh, to, um, to address your concerns. I, I will also say that even if it isn't illustrated on a plan now, we went through a lengthy process where our engineers proposed solutions, their engineers did an independent review of it, and we came to a kumbaya moment on a, the workability of those solutions. We haven't abandoned those solutions. We're just generating a new set of plans. So they will be in the final solution, which includes uh, the ability to tie into the drainage system that's being created as part of this overall project and, and several other features that uh, I think, I think the, the only unique things that will fall away were the things where you were asking the, the hotel for things. But as far as all of this and all of this, we're still working in the same direction we have been. So I, I, I the other thing I'll say is that all of these issues really do need to be resolved before we come back and amend these permits because they were part of the prior permit. Um, the, uh, the city may well be served by coming up with a legal agreement between themselves and Christ Church. I know that Christ Church, if this, is, if this garage is built, will benefit from the availability of parking that will in turn support the development of the affordable housing. So it's not a net loss thing. There's, 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 there's good things in this project for you. But uh, speaking on behalf of the design team, I will say that we remain committed to those fundamental issues of, of uh, not damaging your property. And, and, I, and I hope that you trust us to get that in there, but I expect that you'll show up at all our planning meetings to make sure that we do. <laughs> and so, you know, I... I, I, I ideally, uh, we would have had a number of conversations and sort of sorted all this stuff out. But I haven't Does abandoned any of those principles. No, and so we, we will be going through planning and zoning. We'll be appearing uh, uh, for at least four hearings during the month of October. And, and I think that's the forum where these kind of gut, nuts and boltsy kinds of things get sorted out, the drainage issues and stuff. Mm -hmm.
So let me just say, say one other thing. It is only two feet or two point, two feet three inches or whatever, uh, less green space. Um, the issue is uh, that seems negligible in the conversation, but from a housing development perspective and from the funder perspective and from the historic preservation perspective, all those, it is a very tight piece of property to start with. It was a huge challenge to start with, and any further squeezing of the project was, there were concerns expressed by our, by our housing development partner. So part of this conversation needs to include them uh, so that we can get to a place where we're sure that Continue the, it's the, it's a zero it's a zero setback district. So the the uh, creation of that green space was an accommodation intended to ease your concerns back then. Right. It remains an accommodation now. Uh, so you know, I mean, the, the, the fact that the client has changed, it, it's still you're 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 getting something on your neighbor's property for the mutual benefit of all. And so we understand that, but okay. obviously, very quickly, this becomes a political conversation more than a legal conversation, okay. and and we we just need to know, given that there's only seven weeks until a vote, okay. um, you know, yeah. if this project will preclude us from building housing, then it's a political conversation, not mm -hmm. a legal. One. Mm -hmm. want, it, we don't have any questions about legal, and we hope we can work out. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, and and I just I, I think for me that's also of great concern is that it's seven weeks between now and a and a ten and a half million dollar bond vote and uh, you know I know that we're making some decisions tonight but the fact that these questions still haven't been answered I mean my my constituents are going to come to me and say what does this look like and what does this mean and if we don't have those answers I, I mean I think everybody knows where I stand but but asking those sort of basic questions like does this mean that Christchurch can't do the project or is their project going to change I mean those are important questions that that people have a right to know before they vote yay or nay on this project and I I am disappointed that we don't have those answers right now and I understand for many reasons that we're working on that but this is the kind of project where that's a big ask of the public and to, to not have those kinds of questions answered is well we had a, we had over a year of public hearings right. where essentially this project was discussed in public and during which time we did work out solutions to these problems right but um, now we don't so, have so, solutions yeah, I, I, I really think maybe you're not hearing what we're saying is that from the beginning when we talked about these issues Greg Greg informed us of what had been agreed upon and what was going to happen and we said yes we want to continue to do that so all the solutions that had been approved and permitted there is a change in the, um, you know, going from a 10-foot, so the, the Capitol Plaza had agreed to set 10-foot back from their property line, even though they're not required to do so. In order to fit with everything in and meet our zoning regulations, we had to move that for to uh, 7 feet 9 inches from the property line. So I understand all those so things, I, I don't think I it's like a disconnect of understanding. Well, well actually, it's but just let me, please let me finish. We will not know nor would the Capitol Plaza have known, nor will Christ Church know whether this will or will not preclude the housing because it's the decisions that will be made by people like historic preservation and funding people at the time that they pursue that. They're, they're expressing concerns that it's a tight site with or without a parking garage, the, the, and, and the concern was expressed that even 10 feet might be too close, um, which is the approved garage. So to expect a finality of decision on that one issue at any point until they actually seek funding um, is it's, it's can't happen it's impossible for it to happen so to be disappointed that we don't have that answer I understand we all are but we won't and we can't so that's all I'm saying it just seems like there's a lot of undefined pieces as of right now and we're, we're making some of those definitions tonight mm -hmm. um, but there are still questions that are yet unanswered that seem as though they are important questions to have answered so that people can actually make an informed vote so we'll we'll uh, as you said you know we'll, we're gonna uh, get some further clarity on some of those questions tonight and um, and I can you know uh, uh, I'm excited to say that you know we're going to continue to work with you to we, to resolve we, these I things. Mean, I, we, I'm sure you can understand. We were close to actually having a signed legal document and memorandum of understanding with all these things spelled out. Because sure. once once something's built, as you all know, uh, the, the conversation <laughs> even even though yep. it was made of in good intentions and oh I thought that's what it was, yep. we wanted it in writing and yep. then no. So we'll we'll hopefully and we received a copy of that just today. Oh great. 
Thank um, you. So Thank I, you. our first review was there wasn't much in there that we couldn't agree to. Yeah. So I yep. think we would actually be pretty close to an agreement. That's great. Um, and so hopefully, uh, you know, if the timeline on that is relatively short, I mean, that may happen, you know, in time for the bond vote anyway. Um, I mean, okay, so... It on October <laughs> So, I mean, I would, oh, uh, further comments on the, 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 parts, that the parts that we've been discussing? Yeah. Yeah, this is the first time that we've heard dimensions 115 by 215 or some, uh, some comparison okay. like that. There was discussion at a, the prior city council meeting about spiral tower loading rather than as a contrast to ramps. The ramp discussion apparently eliminated, and you haven't touched on that. We have not yet gotten there. But I'm saying that the spiral is a footprint issue, which is precluded apparently by this footprint boundary. Um, but yeah. you also yeah. spoke about Do you want to answer parking that? garage yeah. egress yeah. entrance through the Haney lot, mm -hmm. which was contradicts what the city manager said a few meetings ago. Pedestrian. That's one of our discussions Pedestrian. tonight. Yeah. Um, we haven't got to yet, Steve. Okay, so that's still still yet. But this is primarily the last commenter brought, re-emphasized a point that I've been making, is that the city, due to prior votes, and despite shifting plans, is in the role of developer. Instead, in, in what is suffering is the role of regulator and protector and that we really do need ha to have independent public advocacy, more skilled, legally skilled, beyond my verbiage, to protect the public interest here because this thing is being pushed by a city that is supposed to be pushing back on every one of these things. We're, we're rushing to accommodate Bashara and Hilton's threat and we are potentially foreclosing uh, better alternatives and opportunities for the church and others. Um, you know, no one's going to want to walk through a five-story by 10-foot canyon to get to this park. So those are the t items that touch on what you've covered so far. Thank you, Steve. Let me load that. <laughs> you can take it off, Barbara. I know. I'm Barbara Conry. Um, I live on Liberty Street. I just had a few questions of clar clarification. Can't hear me. It doesn't sound like this is on. No, it is. Just pull it just down. Or talk talk right closer, right closer to it. it. Yeah. Yes. Really? Okay. All right. You can hear me now. Um, on the packet that was available, um, this is um, a site plan number C1. Yes. Yeah. Is that the site plan you're discussing here today? Yeah, okay, right. I just want to clarify. Um, so this shows a length of the building that is not necessarily consistent with the different concepts that uh, are showing further on. So I'm just wondering, is this the maximum extent of the length of the building? The, the, footprints, the footprints are intended to be all the same. Okay, well the length that's shown on them is not the same, so some of them are shorter. Is this the maximum length that yes. we're seeing today yes. here on this on this segment? <clears throat> okay. And then I guess the other question that it raises for me is does this then take into account the zoning ordinance requirement for setback from the bank? And the necessity for a um, oh, some of the other people will help me better with this, but with a um, a setback to make sure that we don't have any further erosion of the bank and a setback from the river in general. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to take that as a guidepost to make sure that it does. You know, I don't, I don't, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Thank you. If you'd introduce yourself. Yep. Um, I'm Danny Sagan. I'm, I'm on First Avenue. It's all right, Barbara. It's good to have a memory of you being up here. <laughs> um, I'll just, uh, I want to speak to a moment to the idea of the, the top deck of, of the structure, which I assume from the drawings that I reviewed, the top deck is designed to hold cars. Is that correct? Yes. All right, so from my um, uh, rudimentary understanding of the live loads necessary for 
concrete buildings to hold cars, that if we remove the cars, there's still a fair enough uh, structural strength of the building left over to actually hold things like planters and things that don't necessarily weigh 60 pounds a square foot. So I, I want to speak to the possibility that you might build this thing and you might find a post-occupancy uh, review that you don't need all the parking spaces and that you'll have this uh, roof deck floating above the town, which actually, if you go to the parking garage on East State Street and you go up to the roof, it's actually one of the most interesting spaces in Montpelier. And there are other municipalities in the state of Vermont that show movies on top of parking garages. I was in Kansas City, and in Kansas City they actually have a performance space on the top of a precast parking garage that was paid for by the Kansas Council for the Arts. Uh, no, the Missouri Council for the Arts, because it was the Missouri side of Kansas City. Anyway, you can do a lot of really interesting things with the top deck of a parking garage. I, I don't think that, and you can do it without restructuring the building necessarily. Um, so I don't think that should be sort of uh, cast aside as uh, possibilities. And I also think in terms of funding mechanisms, it doesn't necessarily have to be the town that pays for it. Um, the Arts Council could help pay for it. There are any number of uh, funding vehicles that, that would work. I do want to say, uh, given the context of what people talk about, what we do have in this town, what we don't have in this town, we don't have anywhere in this town where children can ride their bikes when it's raining. And if, if you're going to put uh, solar panels on top of the structure um, with enough room to drive cars underneath, it wouldn't cost a lot of money to put some rain shedding so that the kids could ride their bikes on the top when it's raining on the solar panels. Just, just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I couldn't find it now. Was the comment or sound that it would be a good place for kids to ride their bikes? Um, uh, yeah, under, uh, with, uh, during, the, uh, during rain, yeah. Under the solar panels. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get that. Uh, one more comment, Uh My name's Karen Wiseman. I'm the president of the board of the Capital City Farmers Market. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for thinking of us. Um, we have been working with Bill and coming up with some good ideas. We discussed it formally as a board. As a board, we do not have a formal opinion. Um, most people uh, are not actual residents of Montpelier. Um, our ultimate goal is to create a, a vibrant downtown on Saturday morning for us and all the businesses and all the residents. And we appreciate the fact that we need more visitors. We appreciate the fact that we need more parking. And we're really comfortable that we'll be able to work with the city um, to support and bring things back so that the community gets the full potential that they can get and that they should get out of an investment like this. So, Super. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, at this point, uh, does any council want to make a motion regarding a roof or um, anything to that effect? No? Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on. Um, and I think the next part is talking about the structure. So again, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, on the front page of the uh, cover letter, I basically lay out the uh, things that we looked at. Um, I, I want the, the public present tonight to understand that some solutions are, are scale dependent. Uh, given our, our very constrained footprint, and you can tell we're already kind of getting pushback for as much of the footprint as we've used, um, uh, the options that we looked at were, were options that could be built on this scale. And that included a single helix structure, which is also sometimes thought of as a switchback structure. That was based, that was very similar to what was previously approved. You come in and the parking bays themselves slope. Uh, in this case, they slope in five foot increments. So you're going up a half a level, you're going around, then you're going up the other half of the level. And that, uh, that is, um, that was the version that was previously approved, and I, there's some pros and cons to that. The other thing we looked at is, based on public input, there was an expressed interest in whether or not we could flatten the structure so that there'd be some future utility to this thing, some ability to reuse it if people stopped using cars. And um, so the second version is a so-called split-level structure where parking is flat, but at each end of the flat parking decks, there are short, steep ramps that take you up to the next half level. Again, the parking would be going up in five-foot increments, but instead of the uh, roughly 3% slope that the, uh, that the uh, switchback version used, 
the floors would be flat and then the speed ramps would be 13.8% steep, which is perfectly drivable and fine. Although when I look at pros and cons, I will say that some drivers are going to have concern about that steep ramp. It's just going to feel weird to people. Your car is perfectly capable of doing it, but it's a little disquieting for some drivers. Northfield Street, is that like 12, 13% grade? Is Tom here? Uh, Northfield Street, is that like a 12% grade? Northfield Street, grade. Probably closer to 6 or 7. 6 or 7? Berlin Street's probably 6 to 7%. Wow, so it's twice as steep as that. So is there an example that you can give us of a street in Montpelier that's about the 13.8% that we're talking about? Richardson? Prospect? Wheelock? My, the begin the entrance of Town Street? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of parking garages, you know, I, I would say that correlates to say uh, the parking garage at the at the Mont at the uh, Montreal Airport. If anybody's ever been there, they have steep speed ramps mm -hmm. between essentially level levels. Um, and then a, th a third, there's a third sort of version that we did evaluate, which is everything's flat and all on one level with one long steep ramp. Um, we're recommending that, that that's, we're, we're essentially concluding as a design Don't team. Leave that, yet, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that we're, our, our concern on that last version is, is, is that it just doesn't quite fit the site. So we, we evaluated the, the three possibilities that we thought could fit the geometry of this land. We've, we've already kind of eliminated one. So we're asking you to dis decide between the single helix structure and the split level structure. And those are illustrated in your packages. Uh, you should have gotten those earlier today. The, switch, mm -hmm. the uh, switchback or single, uh, or the uh, single helix type is illustrated on the ones labeled A101 through A, uh, I think, uh, 203B. And that's the 13% rate. Uh, the, the first one is the, the lowest slope. That's like that's like less than five percent. Right. That's like a the traditional split parking garage. Yes. Uh, the the so so there's the A series drawings which show that version. The B series shows uh, um, uh, the, the ones that are labeled. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sort of confused. The A's show the split level. Oh, right. Right. The B's show the switchback. And then the uh, C's show the uh, one that we don't think works, the one with the speed ramp on the end. This assumes that there was land beyond the end of the garage, which really doesn't exist. So that geometry takes up too much space to work. Um, but if you if you go to A101, it should look like this to everybody. You'll see that these are essentially flat decks, and then at each end there are these short steep. Can I interrupt you just one second? I think Tom's up here just to answer. Oh, the streets sorry. might have you a question about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I wish I knew all the grades off the top of my head. So, um, I'll give you a better perspective. Um, Course Street is in the 16 to 17 percent grade range that I happen to know about. Um, Berlin Street Hill is in the six to seven percent, so you're somewhere in between those. Mm -hmm. Wheelock is probably your closest, but yeah, I, I don't know that it's it's in that area. Winter Street would be another one, so you're you're not too far off in the twelve to thirteen percent grade. But there are driveways that are very common that are in that thirteen to fifteen percent grade. Very common people use every day. Okay. So, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Or try to use the limit, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 15% that limit is actually a limit that's enshrined in the building code, so we can't really go much steeper than that. Um, these are shorter duration than a street. You know, you're going up uh, 36 feet, you know, and uh, um, they're also generally under cover, so they're a little less. But if you're in a parking garage and you come around that corner and you start to nosedive down, it feels weird to some people. Um, the interesting thing, if you look in that same first series of drawings, the A series of drawings, you can see a cross section through the building at A203 that shows how the levels are shifted a little bit. And it also gives you a sense of what those ramps look like. The first one's cut through the parking bay, the second one is cut through the, the one on the top. A203? Yep. Do you not have one? I have A202 and then A901. 
Mm. Oh, it should look like this. It's, yeah. it's, on a, it's on a title block by Simon Design Engine. Oh, it's on the back. Tricky. It looks like this. I don't have any on the back side. Go further toward the back. Mm. Hey, Mine's yeah. yeah. A-O-1-5. That's all right. That's all right. I got the idea. I saw that on the, on the website, though. Okay. It's Even though you are in here, so I studied them. So I'm fine with it. <laughs> you should trade that. Um, so, I'll make sure when I need I love it. before I leave, but that's I just want to make sure I keep in my head the name of this one. This is the split level. This version. is the split level. <laughs> it's yeah. deeper. It's the split level. Okay. Um, the uh, the uh, advantages of this uh, is it would build quicker. It's probably a lighter structure. Um, you know, I, I kind of listed some pros and cons, but, uh, you know, with the flat surfaces, Ostensibly, the reason we would want to go this way is, at least, is that there would be some surplus use to the building if you ever stopped parking in it. The concern that our engineers have is that parking garages, the loading for them is less than other commercial uses or even residential uses. The, the, the wheel load in the parking garage is only 25 pounds a square foot, whereas a, a house, uh, you know, housing would be 40 in the units and 80 in the corridors. And then most other commercial uses are 50 or 60 square pounds a square foot. That result is, if you're doing this because you think you may want to do something else with the building in the future, you're going to have to up, you're going to have to increase the strength of the structure by probably about 30 percent. It would increase the cost of the, the, the structural frame by about 30 percent to carry those extra loads. So while you may pick this because you like the format of it or you like the way it lays out. You should be aware that if you were, if you were, if your primary reason for doing that was because you could convert it to something else later, that's going to increase the cost now, or it's not really going to be feasible in the future. I just want that to be clear with everybody. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the uh, thirty to forty percent increase is not an increase in the total structure, just that that component of it, right? Yeah, I think it would be the structural frame itself, the connections and all of that, because I think uh, in the end our foundations are, the port in place foundations will be pretty similar. The landscaping and the sewer, all that other stuff will stay the same. And I, I, ex I expect we'll have a similar amount of uh, um, uh, exterior skin to deal with. So what does that boil down to in terms of total cost? Well, 30, 40% more. You know, if, if that if that portion of it is is forty or fifty percent of our budget in year year to year, so. yeah, it's going to be a couple million. Okay, I think. I mean, I I would if I took a calculator and came up with it's it's going to be measured in millions though. Yeah, thanks. So we could do this design without beefing up the structure if we just decide we want to have. If you if you just like the way this works better, uh, you may many people may just like the looks of it better with the level decks. You know, aesthetically, it, it opens up possibilities in the facade. Um, I personally could live happily with either one of these. Uh, we are going to make a recommendation to you, but you don't you you are free to do what you want. You know, you're you're the boss. <laughs> um, so so uh, this cross section I think best illustrates the uh, the concept. Now. This was based on the this was based on the uh, sort of out of the manual designs for dimensions for parking spaces. Uh, we're actually going to go by the dimensions that are in your regulations, which means ultimately, if you picked this version, it would be it would be narrower than it's shown on the plans, um, because they've got 24 foot drive lanes and you don't require that in your reg. We would tighten it up to preserve space for Christ Church, you know, to to, to preserve that buffer. Mm -hmm. um, the other version, the switchback version, that is, it's, it's illustrated in the back, but it's also, it's, it's also thoroughly illustrated in the package in the front here as well. Uh, and I would just go to the second page in your package, A101, on my title block, and that shows it, that shows it pretty well. You'd come in off the street, you'd go, you'd go up a half a level or down a half a level, and, and then it just stacks up like that going on up through. And, um, the advantages of this are that, you know, the whole thing can be done in precast concrete. We wouldn't have any steel components. Um, it's, it's a much more efficient footprint uh, in terms of, you know, 
there's, there's not a lot of wasted space. Um, th this is frankly our recommended version, but again, I, I would happily live with the other one as well. And then I might sort of suggest that if we looked at uh, page A105, for instance, this is the very top level. And, and I'm sorry, this one you're talking about now, this is the switchback option? This is on the switchback option. Um, you know, if, if you came up to this last level here, you see where it says 11. There's 11 parking spaces at the top there. If, if I were going to do any kind of other use other than parking, I, I might look at that end as being a place where you might you know, just put some cones across here and throw a party or something. Um, but at any rate, in the uh, in this in the uh, the split in the uh, split split level one, you know, you've got a you've you've got these layers doing this, so you know, you could do that anywhere. Um, and I I agree. I've been to movies on top of the parking garage in Burlington. It's, it was a cool. That I don't think they do it anymore. But, you know, those kinds of things don't have to be structured. They're just opportunities. And that's Places more of a to watch firework. That's so more of a good viewing of this right. mm -hmm. That's more of a, a use policy thing than a design thing. Uh, I agree that if, if you wanted to have a party up there, there's plenty of strength. It's when you start bringing in furniture and extra walls and all the appliances and stuff that the other weight starts to add up. So, so can we can we pause on that uh, point and compare the, the roofs of the two designs? Um, switchback versus split level. Yes. My understanding is that the, the switchback version, you, you pointed out that page A105, the 11 spaces, that's the level portion, more or less, of that. At, at each end of that, yeah. there's about a 40-foot long flat plate yeah. at each end of this garage. Right. Where you turn around. That's yeah. where your handicapped parking spaces will be. That's where the elevators and the stairs are located is in the flat portion. Okay. And then primarily the long ramps yeah. are, uh, are your parking surface. So comparing that kind of strip of uh, level flat space at the top in that option with the split level roof. Yeah, um, you get 50% of the footprint would be flat and level at that top level. So in some ways, the, the split level option gives you more, say, movie space or party space at the top if, yes. if that were desired. Yeah. OK. I think that's true. Can I say which one is taller? I think I understood that the split level one was taller, but. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking at uh, A203 on Simon Design Engineering's drawings, the transverse sections. That's, that's the best way to understand the split level one. And it's, it's uh, on the high side, which would be the State Street side, it's 41 feet from the, the grade shown on there to the uh, top of the parking deck. There would be additional... Um, at where the stair towers and the elevator are, there'd, there'd be little pieces that poked up beyond that. But your highest parking deck in this one is at the 41.2. And then they've conveniently provided a cross-section at A203B, which also shows um, the uh, stepping levels. The way they have this set up right now is it would be it'd be 30 feet 6 inches from ground level to the... Uh, uh, to the uh, top deck, but at the other end, you're going to be another five feet taller than that, so you're like 35 feet or whatever. And then that result is that the switchback proposal is uh, um, is a little less tall than the other one, by about five feet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm confused with a different. I think they're using different names for both the versions, and I'm okay. In your memo, you use option two, which is split level, right. and it says <clears throat> four and a half to five feet floors, whereas option one, which is the single, um, the, head, the, the switch back, back or the helical. Switch. So option one would be switch back, option two would be the split level. I was so we hadn't seen these when right, I was right. when we were estimating four and a half to five. So what he's saying is about five feet. As I just heard you say, right. about five feet different between option one and option two. And option, option two, two is, is taller. Taller. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry if I've confused you. It's confused me. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> They're both shorter than the hotel. 
they're both substantially shorter than the hotel, which it was approved. Uh, I don't know. The, the, it has different roof levels, but it's it's five stories plus some roof, and it's I think its maximum height is like 57 feet. I think. It's in a district that allows six-story buildings. So, but I think everybody shares the goal of trying to keep the profile of this low, mm -hmm. uh, both to protect the view corridors from Memorial Drive and, and uh, 14 Main Street, um, mm -hmm. but also to you know sort of limit the impacts on a future housing project to the north. Mm -hmm. And to ask the question I asked again, which I think, I'm not sure if I got or understood the answer, which was that with the option two, the, uh, the split level option, if we did not want to plan for adaptive reuse in the future, we would not have to build in the extra 30 to 40% increase in construction costs. Is that correct? That's, that's, so in that case, correct. they would be essentially the same cost. Right. It's I, the adaptive reuse that adds to the cost. It's the increased loading of changing the use from parking to other types of human occupancies. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, oh, Rosie, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, did you say that one of them was narrower, so it would allow more space for uh, the setback at Christ Church? No, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that is that they're all going to be near. The, 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 the consultant drew it at 120. But, but we're going to reduce it down to like 115 by taking advantage of the dimensions that are in your regulations. Um, they did this kind of generically to illustrate the concept. And normally when we design, we just say a parking stall is 60 feet wide. But it doesn't have to be. And in this case, we're recommending that it's not because we've got other values to balance out. Uh, it doesn't matter. Option one, option two are the same width. It'll be the same width, yes. Okay. Uh, so, you sort of uh, mentioned this that uh, the switchback option, option two, one, 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 thank you, um, was uh, well, you mentioned in this packet here that the, this type of structure uh, can be made entirely of precast concrete, which is more durable. So, what that translates to in my head is that um, that has lower maintenance costs right. over time. Right, that's correct. We, we are... Um, That's significant to me. I'm just going to put yeah. that out there. We oh. are, we're, uh, we're, we're not strong advocates of using steel components in parking decks because they have a tendency over time to... Well, anybody who's been to Burlington's airport recently has seen what can happen. You know. yep. And that is required in the split level? That's what the consultants are telling me. Okay. Even without the beefed up structure for the attic loads? No, uh, I, I, I don't really understand why this is, yeah. and I'd be happy to go back and talk to them about it, but I, I, think, it, I think it's some function on how they connect together. Okay. Well, and I so also like the convenience. I mean, I feel more confident in a switchback when I'm driving in them, you know, and I think that we're not big users of parking garage, so I think it's good to be convenient and... I think well that's a big issue here is that comfortable it's, driving it's, it's a big it. difference between 3.8%, which is handicapped accessible, that's handicapped accessible is 5%, versus, you know, 138 to 15% slopes. Okay. That, that's, that's that some people are not going to connect with that well. That, that's, that might present a, um, an accessibility issue. Yeah, you, people people who are disabled presumably could drive up the ramp, but they would have to park on the section that's shared with the elevator and the stair. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, general comfort level is really different between the two. Mm -hmm. for driving. Did you have a comment or question? Yeah, and, I, and I'm only standing here as a, as a casual observer. Uh, the, the required uh, light loads for parking is, a, is depending upon the code that you use is between 40 to 50 pounds per square feet live load, which is the same uh, live load requirements for uh, residential. So converting this to a, a residential building uh, would not necessarily uh, require structural upgrade. Um, and so I don't, I, I just as a, as a taxpayer of the city of Montpelier, I, I don't think the 30 to 40 percent price upcharge for making it more adaptable and deciding whether or not we do a majority of the building flat plates and the majority of the building sloped plates, uh, I still think it argues for making the building as adaptable as possible. And I, and I think we could even do it with the building structure as it's designed, 
um, given the fact that it's a concrete building, a lot of the concrete is designed for deflection anyway. So, thank you. I, I just have to rely on Simon's engineering, who are the experts in this matter. I, I don't have a dog in that hunt. If, I, if it would be great if you were right. I just can't, I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do just want to point out. Uh, apparently, that's a contradiction of information here. That that the the designs that you're presenting assume lower load bearing needs for like something he was saying 40 to 50, and you're saying you can do it for 25 to 30. Remind me what that number was. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm depending on information provided to me by the structural engineer yeah. who said that cars weigh less than contents. Yeah. Because, they're, they're because the, the loads are uniform and predictable. How that translates into extra structural strength, that's an engineering issue. But I'm reporting the expert testimony of our person yep. who says this is how it is. Um, I still think you should make your choice based on which plan format you like the best. And um, then, you know, if, if, it's, if you, he's right and I'm wrong, then you're getting an added benefit. But it really wasn't part of our initial program to try to solve for that problem. Um, and so in terms of comparing one to the other, I think you should set aside that variable and sort of focus on do we like the way this works, do we like the way it looks, um, because they're generally going to produce the same amount of parking and the same kind of footprint. It's really just sort of a different set of functional relationships, and I think that's what we're here to resolve tonight. Mm -hmm. I do know that as we, as we go forward through the process, we'll, there are going to be additional permits from the city that will address that issue. I had thought there was some other um, factors invo involved in, you know, the uh, the reuse that would, were also going to make it prohibitive in terms of the, uh, the the spacing or something or you know space to add. Yeah, I think that's what they were saying. Yeah. That, you know, in order to run pipes and stuff around, right. you're not going to drill through 60 foot long concrete tees because you know they're not made for that. They're pre-stressed yeah. concrete elements. But um, they said, you know, in order for that to be successful, you'd have to add additional height. So that you can route things around and still get minimal eight foot ceiling heights. Um, they've said they've evaluated this proposition a number of times and nobody's ever pulled the trigger on it. And I can say that we met with a different consultant earlier today to talk about the hardware, and they said essentially the same thing, didn't they, Sue? They said, yeah, we've looked at this a bunch of times for clients, and in the end, they never pull the trigger. Yeah. So, so apparently, there's consensus among the people who do this for a living that 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 adaptation has a cost to it, that that future utility has a cost to it. Uh, okay, any other further questions from the council on this? Uh, yes, Jeff. I have a proposal. If, 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 or is that what you're going to ask for? Well, uh, I would love to hear from the public uh, oh, as thought, well, but... Um, if, we, if we have more comments from the public, I... Yeah, like um, if hear. there's comments um, from the public on which option of the structure. Switch back. Now's the time. <laughs> Hi there. Dan Jones from Northfield Street. Uh, am I to understand, then, because uh, everything sort of gets mushed in together, the, the baseline with your uh, switchback model is the $10 million plan yes. is that is that really what I would understand yes I think that, that you're the, estimating, saying, the estimating the date has been based on that design the estimates uh, so that uh, if you wanted to what you're saying there's then a 30 percent additional cost uh, added on if we wanted to have a more adaptable flat uh, floor plan right yes okay so and what you're saying then is that anything over because we have this 30-year business plan that says this is how much revenue we have we can only bond for uh, ten and a half million dollars. Is that correct? That's my recommendation. Yeah. All right. So that anything beyond that then is not actually supportable by revenue and would have to come right. out of the uh, general other fund. sources. Other sources. Yeah. So you're saying so to make the building more adaptable, at least in terms of the way you're analyzing it, then it would be thirty percent greater in cost than having the switchback model. Right. Right. Okay. So you could still pick this option just because you like the way it functioned or you like the way it looked, it's still on the table. 
but but that future utility is the extra cost. The future utility is going to. The, the future the utility cost. is the it's source of the extra cost. The slightly taller floor to floor height. So right. Well, stuff. now if there are competing, like I, I heard over here, competing things saying that the load issue was actually. Uh, the same, and uh, is there a way of having a competing uh, analysis which would tell us that? Because uh, it seems to me that we're uh, com counting on one set of numbers that you're providing, but I heard over here that it actually should be the same cost. Was that correct, Mortimer? No, that was. What I was thinking is that the code requirement for loading for parking garages is similar to the code requirement for loading for residential His point was not about cost. It's not about cost. My, my point was that that you, you may not need to upgrade. If you build it as designed for parking, you may not need to upgrade it to adapt the top two levels for residential, for example. OK, uh, now clarify. Thank you. So I'm still not hearing about the spiral option for loading, which would avoid the need for the... I think you were out of the room when we talked about that. And it was precluded? It's mm -hmm. not possible because we don't have the land Correct. to put the spiral tower? Yeah, to get the same number of spaces. They, they looked at it. It's in the package, but it... Okay. The, 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 it's in here By it cutting is. into that footprint to put a spiral, you would give up two new spaces? Yeah, we either that or we would end up going another level taller. And that was... We can't... We did, we're not considering expanding further on the... <laughs> no else to expand. No. We're trying to go smaller, not <laughs> <laughs> But the, the, the fundamental issue of whether there is a 30% premium on the adaptive reuse has to be answered before you can vote, because if it doesn't cost 30%, or if the parking load is the same as we're getting conflicting information. You're saying you don't know, your engineers know, he's saying he knows Well, it conflicts with what... It's, it's in the building code. So if anybody has a copy of the IBC, we should be able to look it up. It's, it's also beyond the loads, though. The loads weren't the only issue. It's the, extra, it's the extra height so that you can move plumbing back and forth. But you can put sleeves through a pre-stressed concrete as you build them that would allow for retrofitting plumbing through later. Yeah, and, and so you, you might pay 10 bucks a sleeve or something right. that they add up, right? I, I think the estimated additional cost has come to me from more than one source. So maybe the order of magnitude may be in dispute, but there's definitely an extra cost. Okay, but what the point that it's that I'm trying to call to your attention on this is that we are moving so fast that we don't have we have not done the planning for rail, off-site parking, telecommunicate, parking demand mitigation. We have not done the necessary planning to know whether we are going to need this many spaces as Uber and autonomous vehicles and, and passenger rail come into play. We're, we're making a 40-year decision here, and we're even for making an economic decision to foreclose the adaptive reuse that is really irresponsible in the sense that it, we we need to move slow enough to get the planning for how many legislators are willing to park at Dog River or elsewhere and ride the, the train in. Because if, if we're overbuilding parking because we haven't done our homework somewhere else and we're foreclosing the adaptive reuse option to turn it into housing, we're really making a huge mistake. So, again, this is the kind of uh, point that I'm asking you to slow down enough to get those. We need to vote down the bond and take another year to get full options for the pit, full, you know, reduced load for parking analyzed. Thank you, Steve. And just to, to comment, we've done a lot of studies, and Pitt's not on the table. So, uh, Ashley. I just, so I, I was I was on my phone because I was reading about how other cities are, are handling sort of what to do with parking garages that they're, they're not filling. And one, the sort of most common theme is that they are turning them into housing or hotel-type uh, units. So 
I just so if we were to go with the switchblade, am I am I switch right? Back. Switch, switch back. back. Switch back. Switch, switch back. Switchblade is the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it feels the same. <laughs> um, so is what I'm understanding that once the natural life of so let's just assume it's 40 years. Some some studies have said 30. Some have said 50. Let's just go with 40. Uh, so is it that demolition would be the option once it's it could be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think the current thought in the architectural world is you, you address deconstructability as part of the design. So that would you be... You sort of have an exit strategy for mm -hmm. for taking the thing back apart when you're done with it. So it would be, so if we build this, construction would be anticipated complete by 2021? 2020? 2021? 19, I think. Uh, it's going to take six to seven months to build this garage. Okay, so then let's just go with the 30, 40 year sort of midpoint there. So 2049, we'd be demolishing and our bonds would be paid off in 20, 30. 30 years. So we'd in essence have 10 years of extra. Surplus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's obviously assuming the, the models that we. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Presumably oh, that revenue, some of that revenue could be and set aside for the next use or for the demolition costs. It just, I guess my question is, in, in what I've seen, and admittedly that yep. has not been much, What what is the other use for the switch back parking garage? Because everything else, they're, they're the level ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is there is there no other use? Skateboard park. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a very expensive skateboard park. Um, <laughs> Jack and then at that point, and, and the observation I make about this, and I've heard people talking about adaptive reuse and what's going to happen, what we can use this garage for if at some point it turns out that people aren't driving cars anymore and we're therefore not using that uh, garage for parking. And I would think that the the first thing we would do in that case is to remove parking spaces from the streets. That I think that that's a better use than the uh, the the other things that we're talking about, and uh, it makes the downtown a much more attractive and and walkable and livable uh, environment, which I think we would all like to see. Uh, as soon as we can. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. I'm going to try this and see if it works. Um, yeah, so Greg, you had asked for somebody to pull up the IBC. I have the um, International Building Code here, and it says that garages have a 50 pound wide load. Residential, um, multifamily homes is a 40 pound wide load. Hotel rooms is a 40 pound wide load. So I'm not sure where that extra 30% is coming in. And I think okay. we would really need to see something in writing from your structural engineer sure. in order to justify that because I just, I'm not seeing it. Okay. And the concern about the 10-foot floor-to-floor is, yes, it would be difficult to put residential units back into that, but it's not impossible. It could be done. So, so any, any other further comments from the public? Go ahead. My name is Tito O'Brien. I live on Clarendon Avenue, and I'm not sure whether I have a statement or a question, maybe a little bit of both. Um, I'll begin with a, a statement. Um, I think the parking garage is in the wrong place. We clearly need more parking and better parking in this city, and I'm afraid we foreclosed the opportunity to put it anyplace else, so I won't dwell on that point. There are other potential places we could have put it, but again, that's, that's not my primary concern. My primary concern is to speak as the Lorax, which some of you may recall is the person who's concerned about the water quality. And um, I'm real concerned about what happens to the wastewater from this facility. Um, and this comes to my first question. Um, I think you said no net change in the water quality entering the river. Is that I, was, I was speaking about volume in terms of flood events. That that our goal is to make sure that, that we're not 
reducing the capacity of this parcel of land to, a, to deal with floodwaters. That's different from the water quality issue, which is, uh, which is going to be uh, a matter of systems and, and controls. Could you explain the, whatever the systems would be, or not in detail, but just what, how much treatment will water coming off of this site get before it enters the river? Well, um, on each level there will be drop in little scuppers that collect water, you know, at the back of the parking stalls. That will be collected down to the bottom of the building. Those flows will be directed through uh, um, a series of concrete tanks that are intended to remove suspended solids, grit, sand, the like, and, um, and oil. So petroleum-based products, which is in the main the types of things we would expect those would be the, the classes of pollutants we would expect on any parking surface whether it was a surface parking lot or or otherwise um, and and so there's that treatment and then there's an additional system which is more of a storage volume thing which would be um, large diameter EBS pipes underneath the slab which are just there to control the flow of the volume so that we can attenuate at the rate at which it flows back out at which point, it, at which point, it, it, you know, the, the typically would discharge to the north branch of the river. Now, I'm I'm not the civil engineer. I can't speak to, uh, to to sort of the quantitatively about this, but that's my understanding of the system. And, and when the tanks that accumulate the salt, the oil, etc., when they fill up, what happens to those? Well, there's, there's, this is regulated by state law, but there's a requirement for permittees to uh, routinely inspect and clean these facilities out. So, you know, with an oil grid separator, you know, once a year or something, you'll have a specialty contractor who comes in and has to vacuum that piece of equipment out. Um, and so that's the sort of primary thought process right now. Well, I can only speak for myself, but I would think that rather than seek no net change of discharge into the river, we should, as a city, be looking at improving the quality of the water in the river. Now whether, and I don't know whether that devolves to a better treatment system for this site, but I hope, as a resident, that we're not continuing the level of treatment that we're dumping into the river right now. And this well, may be an opportunity to I don't to disagree improve. with that statement. I, I did mention in my written comments that I haven't spoken about tonight that we are looking for opportunities to incorporate xeriscaping into the, into the, the landscape planning around the building uh, for both the hotel site and for the garage, which would then, you know, which would provide uh, additional sort of a natural-based approach to, uh, to uh, treating the quality of the water. Because you know the various wetland plants are sort of efficient at taking those things up and taking them out of the water supply, so um, th there will be features like that, uh, but um, it, it, they'd be sort of ancillary to the primary approach, which is to which is to uh, scrub that water as it comes off the surfaces and before it goes into the to the storage system. <clears throat> There's a wonderful example of a, um, a parking garage in Florida where there is a hanging garden hung off the side of the building which actually biofilters. And uh, you probably know about that kind of approach, but I'm not going to go for that. Um, I just want to go back to something that Ann said earlier about um, the Confluence Park and the impact of this garage on, the, on that Confluence Park. Um, beginning with the visual impact. You're down there to eat your sandwich and talk to your buddy, and uh, there's this massive structure behind you, and I, I guess I just want to raise the question of the quality of that park and how this garage is going to impact it, and whether there's a surface, a face, that could be architecturally designed for plants or for so, benches, et cetera. I'm going to interrupt mm -hmm. you because we're going to talk about the facade um, next. What that can look like. Do you want me to sit like. out or should I come back? Uh, I, I think it would probably be most appropriate for you to come back, actually. Come back. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, thank you. I, and I'll just add one comment to mm -hmm. the question that was asked because I think somehow that got lost. And, you know, I think Tina was appropriately talking about us improving 
the storm system. And um, what exists today are asphalt parking lots with no treatment. So what happens is that all that grit and salt and everything are on those parking lots. It rains and they wash off into the river. So if there is a system in a garage which is collecting and separating and sorting and discharging, it's actually a significant improvement over the, the current status. That's an excellent point, like relative to what we have there now. Right. This would be an improvement. Correct. Yeah. Um, and I just want to go back to one word that I saw in here. Uh, and you used just now zero escaping because I, I would love a definition of it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I could have gathered it. A little, a little dirty. I'm sorry. No, I, it, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of constructed wetlands in, in, this, case, in this case. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's generally, you know, it's a whole suite of low water use approaches to landscaping. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we are incorporating already in the design for the hotel, uh, rain gardens is a common name. Right where instead of going directly into a catch basin, things go into a lawn area where there's plants that, that uptake some of that water and help, help provide some primary treatment. Um, so, you know, we're going to try to incorporate those kinds of features in the green spaces around the building. I, but they're going to be supplements to what else is going on. They might be they might be useful for taking flows from sidewalk areas and stuff like that. But you're not necessarily going to plan to direct all of the flow from the parking garage itself into those areas. Those are uh, yeah. I think the state side. the state of Vermont is going to have some input on that as yeah. far as you know. The engineers tend to think in terms of systems they know work. And, um, mm -hmm. So you know, uh, but we are going to incorporate it in there yeah. as a feature. Uh, so, Steve, before you go, I want to check with the public to make sure that um, there's anybody else who has not spoken yet who would like to make a comment about this portion, the structure specifically. Oh, okay. And this One more. Be, go re ahead. Re regarding the, the structural treatment, tanks, filters, inspections, vacuuming, and earlier we heard about an air-conditioned equipment room, servers, video storage, uh, the cameras, etc. I have a informed sense, a hypothesis that we have severely underestimated the maintenance costs in our cost benefit economic calculation. Uh, I think they were, I saw them at 100,000 or something. They could be double that and totally bust the bank on the revenue models that are, so I just want to call your attention to that okay. because we have not seen many of these systems reflected in that maintenance budget. Okay, thank you. All right, so we need a decision, uh, team, on which option to go with. Um, you were going to make, make a motion, motion earlier. <laughs> yes, I was going to make a motion that I will now that we, uh, we proceed with uh, option one, with the, the uh, switch butt back option um, as being the most uh, practical, the most known quantity, and the most Oh, but this is a motion, so I'll you just keep it short. I'll just stop it. Yeah. <laughs> My motion is option one. <laughs> so uh, do, uh, is there a second? I'll second it. Do you want to elaborate any further on? I don't right. think I need to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, further discussion. Yes. So I would just. I guess I, what I'm struggling with is, and again, maybe this is just my own neuroses, but I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling a little conflicted because I don't feel like we have the full information given what the code seems to say about what the load looks like and so, so what the representation was that there would be this increased cost to make this a structure that we could more easily repurpose at some point in the future for what if, if for example, we aren't able to generate the revenues or, or at the end of its sort of life cycle, we can make the investment or someone can buy it and turn it into housing. Um, and, and again, I just, I feel like my obligation here as a council member is to sort of have the, all of the information available and make the most informed vote. And I just, without having that piece of information, because that's sort of one of the things, like if I am going to be a part of planning this thing that I don't necessarily support, but um, you know, I, I, I don't want to be an impediment to that. Um, it just seems like having that information would be the only way that I could cast an informed vote. Um, and, and as it stands, I'm, I would be leaning more towards supporting the development that would allow us to repurpose it, but 
I, I don't have that kind of information, and and I and I I just I think that's an important thing to point out that that yes, there are these reasons to do the switchback, but other big major cities are, are repurposing garages that were sort of built um, in this split level fashion, and and they are experiencing success in in doing that, and and given the conflicting statements that we've seen and the conflicting information right now. I, I just don't know that we have symmetrical information about both proposals. Further comments? Uh, Glenn and um, Donna. Then, Rosie, did you want to say something? Um, I guess I'm just quite. Oh, that was really loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead, Rosie. So, uh, I am um, uh, not in to support the motion because of the height, um, and I am concerned about every little bit of height that we add to this affecting <laughs> the viewscape and um, the kind of shadow onto neighboring buildings. And I, I realize that the zoning allows us to go higher, but um, to me, in addition to all the pieces that we've talked about, that's really a deciding factor for me. Okay. Thank you, Rosie. Go ahead. Um, I would say I'm leaning toward the split level option for the reasons that Ashley uh, articulated, um, and, and also because uh, I I hear the, the durability argument for the, the switchback. Um, I, I have a sense of the, the possible failings of using the steel in, in the structure uh, for reinforcement. And if the split level requires the steel, that does seem like a, a downside. At the same time, it does feel like, regardless of um, possible contingencies, I, I, I kind of want as much flat surface as I can get. Uh, and, and I can imagine many future and current situations where we, we might want that flat space for something, something worthwhile. Um, I've also uh, been thinking about this for the last few weeks and, and sending my thoughts out to uh, people I know who are creative, buildy types. Um, and almost to a person when I present uh, curved or flat, or like sloped or flat surfaces, they say, no brainer, make it flat if possible so that it can be used for something other than parking at some point. And that, that feels strong to me. Um, I, I, I do wish that I knew <coughs> better uh, exactly what the, the the load numbers were that that I'm I'm unhappy that that is not uh, perfectly clear. Donna, okay. Well, I'm definitely supporting the switchback, and part of this is my experience of garages. They're just much more comfortable to drive in, and I'm looking at this structure to be a garage for 40 years. I want a garage that's going to work, that people are going to be comfortable using, and that it'll give us more spaces. I also like Rosie, like the height. And the other aspect is your engineer, your company has an engineer set. You and Sue talk to another firm of engineers. That's two engineer firms. And in all due respect, you know, it's like having legal advice. No matter what lawyer we have here, somebody disagrees with us. So I think it's much more than just weight load in, in that engineering assessment and I'm willing to go with these two opinions we can certainly explore it more but I feel comfortable with that and I do appreciate that you did talk to a second firm so that's where I'm at I'm gonna switch back great um, so just so you know what my values are I think I might have mentioned them um, uh, the, the fact that the uh, split level is less convenient uh, for um, ADA accessibility. <coughs> Not that it would be inaccessible exactly, but it would be less convenient. Um, that that matters to me, especially as we're, you know, considering that this might be um, parking for uh, some senior housing. Um, and and two, uh, I mean, I, I share Jack's opinion that, you know, if. Uh, uh, you know, anticipating that this is going to be a parking garage for a long time, um, and that if it's not uh, full, that we can be eliminating parking on the street, yes. that we can be eliminating other surface 
parking spaces. That to me seems very exciting, um, and that this is a place where we can um, concentrate parking in the city, uh, and that you know even in the well, the long run, right? Like one vision of the future is that we have autonomous electric vehicles driving around. They're going to need a place to plug in, and this could be a place where they do that. Um, so I'm still hopeful, even in that 40-year future, that we're we're still good. So. Um, I think we probably can guess how this vote's going to go based on all of our statements, but um, I think we should we should vote. So, um, all in, uh, no any further discussion. <coughs> all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Yay. I was not. Oh, you were not. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. But we have to do a roll call. We have to do a roll call vote because because it was not an, um, yeah. unanimous. Um, so, uh, Jack. Aye. Uh, Rosie. Aye. Glenn. Aye. Donna. Aye. Ashley. Nay. Okay, so we have four votes in favor, so that motion passes. Um, thank you all. Um, moving forward, trying to keep an eye on the time. We're doing okay. Could, could be worse. Could be worse. <laughs> okay, so on to the facade. If you would, I'm going to pass it over to you. So the, the design process is... Uh, is a matter of wrestling with the details. Um, I'm presenting conceptually our approach to the design of this exterior facade in full recognition that there's a lot of room for improvement that I expect will unfold as we perfect the application and go through the design advisory committee and the development review board. But the, the facade is presented on this color image or on the cover sheet of this, and there are, there are extra copies here. Anybody in the public? Can somebody send me a picture of that? Like, email yeah. a picture of it to me? Sure, I'll do it right now. I'll get it. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. But what we, what, this, these, this is an outgrowth of our long discussions with, uh, with the folks at Christ Church and our earlier approval process. The facade is, is comprised of two primary components. There's solid masonry portions that uh, occupy the corners and, and portion of the facade. And then there's this fuzzy green business you see going on here, which is uh, which is something called a rhythm wall or green screen. What that is is it's a uh, it's a uh, metallic matrix that's designed to support plant growth. And our our, our thought process is that we don't want to have to mechanically ventilate this garage. We want air movement through it. We on the other hand. This, we don't want sort of a big concrete building right in the middle of town, but this does a couple of things. It provides sort of living material, which cleans the air coming and going from the garage, but also filters the light from the outside coming into the garage. And, and, um, and it, you know, as opposed to, to hard surfaces, you've got a matrix of plants growing on it. What kinds of plants? Uh, Virginia creeper, Boston ivy, English ivy, trumpet vines. Wisteria. Uh, Wisteria. Um, so you can imagine, you know, I mean, especially the wisteria. I don't know if you've ever seen it in bloom, but, you know, mm. it, it, at certain times of the year, this thing's going to be covered with, like, purplish white flowers kind of cascading down in long tendrils. What does um, winter do to it? Mm -hmm. Well, all of these are, all of these are, are plants that have uh, a success of uh, planting here in Vermont, and, um, you know, uh, several of those species are evergreen, so so. Are they, is that so, green in the winter? Uh, the uh, the ivies oh. will, yeah. Okay. Um, and so the th the thought process here is that uh, it started when we thought there was going to be a housing project next door. What are they going to see when they look out the window? Is it going to be a brick wall or is it going to be this? And you can imagine over time birds and stuff uh, occupying this uh, material. Uh, you you know. Um, so at any rate, those, those the, the sort of primary design concept is that we would break the facade up into smaller, understandable pieces by kind of having this shift between the solid and the light. Um, so uh, the typical brick tower would be detailed more in like a classical building. There's, you know, I've, I've shown some granite trim bands going through there and a few other features. There are these kind of large openings in the brick walls. And those were, those were conceived of and have, you know, have always been thought of as an opportunity for, for a more artistic statement. That, that the, those kind of angled bars you see mm -hmm. in there are, are a gesture towards something sculptural happening in that opening. 
that um, that would uh, create kind of visual interest. And and we're very open to to, to all kinds of input on what what those could be. Um, you know, I'm inspired somewhat by the the, the uh, classic bowstring truss uh, bridges that you have coming in and out of town. And so, you know, having these kinds of jumbles of steel parts is meant to be a kind of a reflection of that. But it's also kind of like bike spokes and things like that at the same time. These things could be colorful. Um, so we, we very it's much... Contest. Would, <laughs> yeah, we can. <laughs> Give it to the We uh, would very much like committee. to see uh, some, some art incorporated into this facade. And those, are, those were sort of purposely created opportunities for that. So you've got the you've got the masonry traditional. Those these those are the flat portions of the building. So it kind of expresses what's going on inside there. And then uh, and then you've got the green wall system, uh, which is illustrated, uh, you know, growing up the sides of the building. I gave you some photographs in the cover letter of, of green screen installations from around the country. Uh, this was from the actual manufacturer, um, and you can see they've got a mixture of ivies and, and, and hanging plants and. One of these is in Iowa, I think. And the very last Iowa, one. Iowa, I think. Sorry. Hmm? I just, Iowa. Oh, Iowa. Iowa. OK, thanks. The very, Sorry. Last Sorry. One show, <laughs> the very last one shows you a new installation of the plane just getting started. Oh, yeah, sure. Just to give you a sense of, OK, it's going to look like this until that grows in. Because that's been a question that's been raised. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear on that, uh, these are open spaces behind that, that Planting. It's like a three-dimensional chain link fence. It's a box yep. about this thick, and it's got slender wires going all through it like a space truss. Yep. And and ivies, you know, they they yep. they want something to climb on. And, and, and just, behind that, there's not a concrete wall. There are no. you're looking through. There's the there's going to be a wheel yeah. stop at sort of at sort of the you know foot off the floor, and then there's going to be a bumper stop at like 18 inches off the floor. And then beyond that, if there's any large openings, we'll have, we'll have some kind of railing system that, yeah. to keep people from falling out on of the, big holes. On the top floor here, you can see sort of the meshing. Yeah. So uh, one question about how removable those panels are. I mean, they come in, I assume, some width, you know, maybe for our purposes, it would be like one entire... Uh, you know, length, but is it sectionable, I guess is my question, and how easy is it to remove? And the reason I ask is because I could imagine sometime in the future, like let's say we have a public arts commission that wants to put in some, that might want to remove a panel of, of greenery and replace it with giant art or something. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, we're using this, uh, we're using this also as a, um, as a means to sort of provide an edge to those floors so that people don't fall out of the building. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, there are horizontal stanchions or arms that come off of the, the primary structure, and then this is this is sort of bolted to that. And uh, I would think so long as it was maintained, the only difficult part of unbolting it would be, you know, you'd have to, you'd have, these plants, once they grow in there, are going to be <laughs> yeah, might be tricky. Um, people who know Burlington, I'm sorry I keep referring to other places, but uh, the Gallagher Flynn Company was, was, on, was on College Street, and that building has just been kind of encapsulated by, by uh, vining uh, ivies, which ironically, there's no green space or anything. They're coming right out of the sidewalk, and they've practically swallowed the building. Hmm. Um, this, is, this is on purpose. <laughs> These plants are gonna. These plants are gonna thrive in this kind of environment. Um, but yeah, it's it's reversible. It's demountable. Mm -hmm. It's just I think. And in sections or the whole. It thing? only comes. It only comes in panels, and we're okay. gonna, we're gonna make an overall. Well, that last image in the uh, in the cover letter sort of shows you. It's you know, a given section is gonna be like four by eight or something, and and we're gonna bolt them together to make this effect. So it's modular. It's not fabricated on site. Uh, it, it's going to come out of a box. It's going to get bolted together, and then we're going to put it up. Wagner Hodgson tells me we should see pretty respectable growth within about three years. Um, in, the, in the meantime, it's going to look like this. Um, and yeah, over time, there's going to be some requirement to, to baby those plants, just like any street tree program. Or, but uh, anybody who's got a woodlot, like I do, you know, uh, trumpet vines are. They're tenacious. They're they're not weak plants. Um, so um, so this was our this was our broad scheme. And if if 
if the public wants something else or there's a sense that, that, that uh, there's something missing here, we're open and receptive to, the, to that input. Uh, just the evolution of it was to, to, uh, you know, to accommodate our neighbors, but it, it grew into a kind of a good idea for the whole project. Um, there are some large flat surfaces where murals or other kind of artwork could be accommodated. And there's also sort of, you know, we're at the ground level where the building meets this parkland thing, there's an opportunity for some public art in there as well. One suggestion that came to me from, from one of the public was to go around the top of this thing and sort of have panoramic pictures of Montpelier and a description of what you can see from this vantage point, mm -hmm. which I've seen done very successfully and would love to see happen here. Um, but, but, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a, a combination of traditional solid materials like you might expect to find in Montpelier and then something completely different, which I think when we talk about the Confluence Park, this is the backdrop to that. So, you know, to have this living material here is an important sort of uh, uh, sort of proscenium against which that whole activity happens. Um, and I, I will say the good news as far as anybody concerned about the park is, is that we're on the north side of the park, so you know, the southern light and everything is, it's, gonna, it's still going to be a well-lit space. Uh, this thing isn't going to cast long shadows on the, on the park because it's the so park's on the sunny side. side of the building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, yeah. just on that point, uh, we've got two long walls, yes. uh, and one of them is a north wall, yep. kind of facing toward the, the, the housing, the potential housing. Yes. Uh, are we concerned about the green wall on that side surviving? Some some plants are shade loving, and some plants are sun loving. And the, the landscape architects have kind of have kind of come up with an approach for each side, as I understand it. Okay. So, Ashley, I guess so. I'll be perfectly candid. This kind of looks like a jail to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I Mont, Montpelier is as everyone calls us, Mont Peculiar. And it just kind of strikes me that this would be an opportunity for this thing to sort of embrace that a little bit. And I, I just, I, I'm not super fun. It looks like a government building to me. And I realize that there are reasons for that. Uh, I lived in Boston for a number of years. And Boston has been ready for years to sort of get rid of that government building look. Um, and it just seems like there's so much opportunity for us to like make this something that's not like kind of a brick structure that's just plopped in an area. And I, I, I really don't like those bars across the windows. That's it's. See, I picture those as like being multicolored. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Or, Okay. But, but fair enough. I I just, like That's okay. It just seems like there's <laughs> something that we could do to make this a more unique mm -hmm. structure if this is something that the city is going to invest in and everyone sort of jokes about us being not peculiar. Why are we kind of picking this very basic generic? Do you have any thoughts as to like what could be different? I mean, I, I just Googled some things and, and I realize that that probably adds a significant sum of money to it but there are some that have art installations on the outside so mm -hmm. like around the entire parking yeah. garage um, I think that's kind of unique I think we have some great local artists who would probably be willing to contribute to that um, I mean I'm just I'm looking now there are some where it's just a, a fixed art installation some of them seem to change some have different colored lights I'm not saying that we would do that <laughs> given I know how much of a debate we had about lighted signs <laughs> um, but it just seems like th this could be an opportunity to sort of make this reflect some of our own community mm -hmm. values and sort of embracing that eclectic um, kind of downtown vibe. And I just, that for me just doesn't come anywhere close. Well, it sounds like some of the things you're suggesting are things that could be incorporated mm -hmm. and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for not that much cost. On this, so. right. right. I just and a lot of them I, I think I kind of struggle. So public safety is also a concern in parking garages and this is an awful lot of closed space. So there's like an entire closed off wall, so there's no light coming in from there. I realize it's lit from the inside, but the ability to see into structures um, and making sure that they're well lit, and I know there's gonna be video cameras and things like that, it just seems like maybe having a more open concept for the parking garage, and I know that creates other issues in terms of like, you know, weather maintenance and things like that, but 
it just the open the more open walls on parking garages seem to lend themselves to more sort of community art installation than a brick wall which typically tends to lead to like graffiti and which is fun and cool <laughs> I mean but I, it just seems like for ten and a half million dollars we could make this a, reflect a little mm -hmm. bit more the talents that we have in our community and one, one thought I have which which isn't reflected in the drawings but but what's going to get there is so we can edit this green screen it doesn't have to be uniform we can put holes through it we can have a variety of openings and stuff to give it more of a look but I'm I, I would love to funk this up a little bit if 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 there's consensus that yeah we're ready for that I you know I I I, th I think there was a, a sort of palette of materials that we wanted to present because we thought they were appropriate. But but within that palette, you can do a lot of funky things with brick, you know. Or or, or maybe maybe you all say, well, the brick's not that important to us. We want something else. There are going to be portions where we want some solid wall, where we where we come closest to the hotel. We kind of need that short section of wall to be solid, um, you know adjacent to where the church wants to put their housing project there's going to need to be some kind of solid wall for fire safety and to let them optimize how many windows they have um but um yeah I, anybody else got ideas about how we, we can get i've got a couple ideas um one um is what you're saying we could do interesting things with brick and i'm just wondering about what kind of cost does it add to do some interesting designs in the book like a lot of the historic buildings have um, in terms of, you know, just adding some some more kind of detail and molding um, more historic brick work um, that a lot of the downtown buildings have. Uh, I would assume that would have cost, but I don't have an idea of, of ballpark on that. In my opinion, no. I, I, I have done a lot of brick buildings, and in my experience, you know, the, the mason's got to put the brick there. If he sticks it out a little bit or pushes it in a little bit, he's only too happy to do that. They, mm -hmm. they love to be creatively expressive, and you know, I mean, they get good production out of large pieces of wall. But we've we've always tried to incorporate stuff like that in our work, and never found you know anybody really made a big deal out of the cost of it. How much do you think it would cost to add some like historically reminiscent molding? Do you know what I'm t you know what I mean? Like something that's not just. Uh, well, flat. you know, we're doing that on the hotel building. We've got sort of traditional moldings around the windows and stuff. You know, you could kind of like go around and find some some architectural remnants and just sort of put them into the wall. I, there's a great stone builder who, who does stone walls with wheelbarrows and stuff in them. And so if, if there's support for that kind of idea, I think the way to do that would be probably to... Uh, to kind of charrette with the public, you know, have a thing on a Saturday morning or something and get that input. I have a question. Does that, how does that fit in the process of um, the permit application and everything? I, I think what, I think, you know, I mean, it's your permit process, but my, my guess is we would, we would reserve portions on the places on the building where this was meant to happen. And we would say, you know, based on public input or whatever. I, because essentially what I think the de design advisory committee is going to be most in, involved in that part of it, um, you know, I think if we go to them and say we, we, we're reserving this space for a significant piece of public art to be determined, I think they would be supportive of that. Mm -hmm. Which is why I like the brick as a base, because then it goes with the rest of the neighborhood, but it does need to be livened up with art and variety in the brick. Mm -hmm. So if we can go up and have that reserved and work on that, that's great to me. There's, there's nothing that says we have to use one color of brick or mm -hmm. that we have, or the brick has to be red or any, you know, I mean, we're painting the building next door. I mean, it's a brick building, but we're putting paint on it mm -hmm. because we're going for a certain very traditional look. But, um, no, I... Be white? What's that? It's going to be the hotel. The color, white. the color here, white and gray? It's, it's granite, limestone, and white painted brick. Okay. Uh, Ashley, go ahead. I just want to raise, I just got an email from a constituent, and I heard from one other person as well. There's apparently, they can't hear anything on the ORCA broadcast right now. Oh. I'll look into it. <laughs> Sorry, Thank I you. just. <laughs> I'm so glad that you brought that up. I was just looking um, to make I, sure I didn't. I had a couple other thoughts as well, um, if I can jump in. Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
when is the currently those large openings are square? And I was thinking about um, what makes some of those other buildings in Montpelier look look unique and historic. And I'm thinking about the people's uh, back mm -hmm. which is actually a modern yeah. building mm -hmm. that has those lovely big arches that I think are meant to kind of harken back to the train station that was there. Um, and I'm not mad about doing an arched the arched openings there rather than the square openings. Oh my gosh, um, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, that's what, 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 what about I, a, I would love that. <laughs> what about a big circular opening? Oh, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll, Sorry. I'll, I'll, well, do you want to, if you have more to say, Rosie, I don't want to cut you yeah. off there. So. Um, and so the other thing that I was thinking about was the arched openings, what does it look like to kind of blast them the way that a you know, large factory window type thing you know, thinking about historically what would have been in this space, mm -hmm. would it have been, um, I think it was granite sheds there, but would there have been kind of mill buildings or that sort of thing? Um, those, those institutional buildings of the late 1800s, what kind of openings would they have had? Um, mm -hmm. And so thinking about the design there a little bit. And also, I think what Ashley's saying about it looking like a prison, I think a lot about it because of this tower. And I'm wondering if we can do something a little different to the roof of the tower um, to make that kind of augment the skyline of Montpelier. Um, yep, is so there a way to do some cool molding around the edge of that roof to make it look like a turret or something? You know, how could that change? Because right now, I think it does kind of look like a guard tower. Yeah, it's um, an arch, too. Or yeah, I, I. You know what? I I can totally see it now that you say it. It makes me feel bad to admit <laughs> that. But um, you know, I I, I think uh, there there's a lot of things we can do to the top of those stair towers. I'm just sort of reflecting the fact that the stair towers are going to pop up a little bit relative to the rest of the building. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a mm -hmm. functional space requirement thing. But I'd be happy to look at that element and try to take some of the. Low art. And then one final thought was um, about um, maybe incorporating some granite um, just because that is such a local material. Um, and so some of these places that I think are kind of just maybe it's white cement um, making those granite as well. I know that's probably more expensive, but. Um, no, we meant for those to be stone bands. Um, okay. We, we use a little bit of real stone in, in most of our projects. and. You know, if, if you use it judiciously in the right place, it doesn't bust the budget. It's just, you know, um, no, we, we, we'd like to see some real stone in there as well. Um, and then, sorry, one, one last one. Um, there's some of the other parking garages that I've seen that I liked, and I don't know how other folks feel about this, but I have seen some that do a sort of... Um, concrete cast lattice work that kind of feels maybe a little 1930s. Um, I don't know how, I'm trying to think, I've seen it somewhere in Vermont and I don't know where. Um, and I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, but it's sort of like, it's a, a lattice screen, you know, open, open air, but it's um, cast out of concrete with some interesting designs in it. Mm -hmm. huh. Does it? Yeah, we're getting various oh, I reactions. Think, I think I know what you're talking some about. Some people, yes. Yeah, some people, no. <laughs> I, I think they're called textile blocks, and and oh, okay, they're they're, they're they're laid up, and you, there's sort of air goes through them, but they're they're you know there's different diamonds, there's rounds, and yeah, un unfortunately they don't make those anymore. You, to to get them, you got to find them. Uh, Did you have a picture there? Yeah. Oh. oh, it's so interesting. Can we get the AC back on? It's sure. getting very it was, warm. It was the sound factor. I know. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just a little bit for a little while. Uh, uh, Rosie, where were you thinking of for that? Please come forward. <laughs> I mean, just, and I, all of those ideas don't necessarily go together, um, but uh, that was just another idea for some of those openings um, or some of the, the more solid walls. Um. Yeah. But I do like the predominance of the greenness and having the the other things supplemented. Um, oh, Glenn, you had a thing. Yeah, uh, I just want to weigh in a little bit on broad questions of the design. Uh, I really like the idea of the, the greenery. I like the idea of the openings, all of them, through the greenery and, and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Um, personally, in some ways, I, I have some hesitancy about uh, adding decorative moldings or some kinds of decorative brickwork um, because I, I don't want it to be uh, 
a kind of gilded or or, or just <laughs> applied to the surface kind of look. And and uh, for instance, when you're talking about the, the the steel structures that you can see in these drawings through the the openings, um, a lot of the beauty of those old bridges that you were talking about and referring to there is you're seeing the actual structure. Like yeah. that's one of the things that makes that beautiful is that you can see that it's holding itself up. Um, and I would be in favor of elements like that that are that are at least uh, reflective of the structure rather than than a kind of decoration applied to uh, something that, that depends on something else for its structure, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I, in, in a way, I, for, for instance, I, I happen to often like the look of concrete facade. Uh, if that's what the, the, the building is made of. That feels like a, a kind of honesty uh, to some degree. Uh, I don't want necessarily want it to be all concrete all the way across, but I, I think that a, a kind of, you know, if it's a modern parking garage, which it is, then make it a cool, modern-looking parking garage and don't necessarily try to make it look like it's a factory, which it isn't, um, you know, an 1800s factory. Uh, I'm not going to uh, die on this hill, but I, I, I just want to—I uh, I just want to put that point of view into the conversation. Um, and I think that it, it is compatible potentially with uh, what Ashley was talking about earlier—a certain kind of uh, downtown, you know, active urban contemporary feeling. I don't know if that's really what you meant, but that's what I heard. So. Do you have a I get nervous when you use the word contemporary because city center got put in to be contemporary yep. and nobody liked to live with it. We've done everything to reduce it to make it be more compatible. It, it doesn't have to be necessarily an imitation, but some flavor mm -hmm. of its neighbors. That's mm -hmm. all. Please, not another city center. <laughs> I agree, not another city center. That's, that's the balancing act. Oh. But, I mean, it's clear we need to loosen our tie a little bit yep. on this one, and I'm happy to do that. I, I really appreciate these insights because it'll be a lot more fun to do if... if loosen our ties, that's a good way. I mean, look, what if you don't wear a tie? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Scarves. Yeah, there you go. A tie of some sort. Just direction what you should wear. I would have liked some direction about what to wear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, so funny. <laughs> Um, so one, one more thing I wanted to add on the facade, um, is I'm looking at the images of the first floor, um, and that feels unfinished to me, those first floor openings. Like, I think there could be some more done there, um, to make like them feel like they're not just, I, I understand that they're for a little flood water to flow in through us. Well, I have, a, I have a volume I'm, tr I'm obligated to provide. There's a formula for it, and as long as I hit that number, I can, I can manipulate these openings. So, um, yeah, is the, 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 the I get it. I, I like look at the here. image, but I'm not understanding what she doesn't like. Like, like these de these openings on the first floor yeah, down here. The ones just the north or and south. The ones with the with the uh -huh. sort of like railing. They just have some like bollards in front of them. They're just kind of these square openings, and you see okay. the cars, and there's no. I don't know. They just they seem unfinished, and the rest of the building has something going on, and then this is just kind of. Okay. Well, that's for the jailbreaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> what, what I would like to do now, I mean, if uh, no other council has any further comment, um, I want to turn to the public, get some public comment, and then I want to talk about the process for making a decision about this. Um, so, I think that could use a little clarity. Um, so, comments from the public. Brent Ehrlich. I uh, live on Winter Street, and I just like to comment on the green walls. I'm a big fan of biophilia, so I'm, I'm with you there. But um, and it's great that you pulled up all these, these fantastic images. Um, there are actually quite a few. Uh, my my job is a green building products expert, and uh, that's what I do. So I love I love them, but there are a lot of uh, instances of them failing. And typically, they require a maintenance contract to 
keep them looking good. Insects, blight, they require watering and fertilizer. They're actually a lot of work. Um, so I just throw that out there to make sure that you guys are aware that if you go down that road, you got some, you got an investment. And if, if that, if the look of that facade and building depends on that, there's, there can be significant issues with the aesthetics if things are not going well. That does I hear a committee being formed. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, that does can I interrupt you on that? Because I have a question yeah. um, related to that. So we have a green wall on the district heat plant. Uh, uh, what is our, do we know what the maintenance is on that? We, we don't. don't. Control that. So. Okay, so no, we can probably find out. But we can find out. Okay, so I no, continue. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I also throw that in because, you know, if you do have to have a service contract, that's another cost thing mm -hmm. to throw yep. in there. And if you are going to go down that road, which I'm, I'm fine with as long as that's all taken mm -hmm. care of, um, I'd just be really cautious about overstating the air quality thing. There's actually really no data on them providing that benefit. Okay. I've done a lot of looking into the ones that are used on interiors because people try to upsell that unbelievably. <laughs> and uh, I've looked at this in detail and uh, um, the, the data just isn't there to support it. I Thank mean, you, common yeah. sense would tell you that it does provide some benefit, but there's really no tangible evidence out there to do that. So I would just say, if you are gonna do this, don't try to sell it as okay. that as a benefit. Thank you, so, yeah, that's helpful. Let him learn. Yeah. Barbara. Perfect. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to make clear is that I'm not necessarily opposed to this project. I know it sounds like it. I just it's want okay. to make sure you're clear on it. Um, it's just that I want to make sure we do it right. And so, you know, and as you can probably imagine, I'm kind of stuck on zoning. So um, zoning is my thing. So um, one of the things that's come up for me about the facade, and I don't, you know, I, it, it certainly has, has appeal, um, but if we are following the new zoning ordinance, in which it looks as if the Hampton Inn attempted to do in terms of articulation and varying roof heights and all of that, um, but it does not appear that the parking garage is following the architectural standards for this district. So I, I guess do we waive architectural standards for the city? Sorry, how so? It would be because there are certain requirements in terms of articulation. You know, the building not just being a mass and being in certain openings in, in various. I mean, even in the old zoning, there was for the downtown area, there were requirements. So you know, it's it's fine if we want to just come out and say that we're going to waive that. Um, and, but, you know, I think we need to be clear about it. I'm not, I'm still not clear on what the problem is. Well, I, I certainly, you know, quote it for you from the, the okay. zoning, but, you know, that the building But it has to do with mass? So it has to do with mass, and it has to do with the brick face, the flat face of the building. Because what we're trying to do is to make buildings that are compatible with the downtown. All right, and we don't have too many buildings that have a 200 long wall a facade that has no articulation to it. And so I think that is, I mean, yes, the green space is an articulation to some extent, but uh, not a not a mass. So what you're saying is that a long flat wall doesn't meet it, that we're looking for uh, some sections being farther forward, some sections being farther back. And art would do that. And it's uh, uh, replicating the way the streetscape in Montpelier looks where there's a whole, you know, it could have five big brick buildings in a row, but <coughs> it doesn't look like all one thing. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. That's helpful. So we were going to go through. Oh, um, before there's, a, a, is there any further comment from the public on the facade? Right, yeah. Very briefly. It's great. It's great. Uh, these are the first dimension elevation drawings, and again, it's on the point of how much time this is going to take, because an analysis of public safety video angles, uh, emergency response in and out, if certain one or more entrance or exits are blocked by a car fire or vandalism, uh, I'm encouraging you to move slow enough to do this right, or plan it well enough to do it somewhere else. 
Thank you. Okay, so I could use some clarity on the, uh, any further comment from the public? Um, so I, I could, uh, I would love to talk about where we go from here because, um, I mean, you brought up this idea of a uh, design charrette, um, and it, uh, on the one hand, like, I really like that idea, um, you know, again, getting more public input, more creativity into it, I think is a great thing, and, but I also know that we have to submit something on um, Friday, so, um, and fair enough, like, I think there could probably be placeholders in that, um, uh, you know, application that's like something interesting goes here. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to look to Bill or to you two both to think about like how we can structure that. Like, what would be? It, it seems like we could we could parse this out. You know, what is if there is consensus about um, you know certain things like. You know, let's do something with the towers so it doesn't look quite like you know the prison guard you know structure. Um, but so that we could you know, yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Let me offer you a lever. I think okay. Perhaps it would be appropriate for the city council to sort of put together some uh, guiding principles for the design advisory committee and the development review board to consider when reviewing the the formal proposal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly at a minimum, I've heard we need to make sure that we're in compliance with the new zoning regs as far as the articulation of the facade. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm definitely hearing a, 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 a big vote for um, uh, considering amassing and looking for ways to articulate it in ways that, that make it not, not look like a prison. I think we all have, we share that goal. Um, so, <clears throat> You, you know, we can take the input I've got tonight and fold it into our drafting as we prepare these applications. But I, I think from your perspective, the thing to do would be to make sure that, that these concerns get folded into some kind of checklist for the for the review boards mm -hmm. to, uh, to take off. It, it seems to me like we maybe, as you're suggesting, like we should be making a list of the, at least the guidelines of what, how we'd want to see this be changed yes. in general. Is that... That would be useful to you? We're totally open to change. We're eager to make the change. I okay. think, you know, we're not going to be able to make it for you tonight. But as we go through this process, which will last for most of the month of October, we'll, we'll have at least two meetings with each of these mm -hmm. boards, maybe three. Um, and as we come before them, they'll say, well, okay, based on, based on our instructions from the city council, we think you have too much of this or not enough of that. Or we well, so, so let me hop in there. Yeah. The, the boards would not take instruction from the city council. They, they act independently okay. in terms of their review. They would take their instruction from the regulations whether or not the proposal complies. The council can't interfere with the board process. I think you and I can take instruction from their desires to create uh, a product that meets those principles. So they can't, they can't direct the board to say, no. here's what we want you to approve. Yeah, that's okay. It's very similar. Because yeah. 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 the issue has been raised that we are the, yeah. promoting this, but we're also the regulator, and we're really keep, trying to keep those roles separate. Okay. They need to be separate okay. and, and distinct. Um, I was going to suggest that we have to file an application by Friday that the, the most important things, the footprint, the dimensions, those kinds of things, to start the ball rolling. Um, it could be, and, and I think Audra had said we actually should give us another week if we could make a mind, uh, design amendments. Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, the first steps are the subdivision of the land, which is, is going to be fairly straightforward, but has to be processed. There's a whole lot of utility stuff that has to be sorted out that uh, that won't be impacted by design. Um, yeah. But, but I, I, would, I would think we could substantially improve this by the time we submit on Friday, and then what we should do is sort of monitor our progress in terms of how that improvement is coming together moving forward. And the council meets next week, so you can always float a revised design at least mm -hmm. at that meeting feedback yeah okay. and, and you know we, we're happy to put this thing up on, on a uh, any kind of public website or anything yeah. as it goes okay. forward to kind of virtually sure read it yeah. um, because uh, I like the energy you brought to the beginning of this conversation <laughs> it's probably the only positive <laughs> thing <laughs> anyone <laughs> has to say about me you know I'm a big fan of Portlandia the, the TV show and I, you know, I said, you know <laughs> Montpelier is one of those great places that really has a personality. You know, it's not uh, faceless, nameless. We get most uh, a lot of places in the world. We shouldn't screw that up. So 
so yeah, I'm I'm happy to go back and, and take a whack at that. I, you know, even though I live in Richmond, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to see if there is. Um, I'm not sure that I, I'm feeling like we need a vote necessarily on this, but just see if there's general consensus about a series of um, sure, bring them up changes, up. right? Straw votes. Um, and if I'm missing anything, um, you know, let me know. Oh, yes. I, I should just say I got a communication from a constituent suggesting another way to rake up the mass is concrete facade with murals on it. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, obviously, Doing a mural is guaranteed to be controversial because everyone has their own idea of what yeah. they want to look like. And they have to maintain them. But at any rate, that's, that's just okay. one suggestion from one person. I didn't want to yep. go by without mentioning that. Um, I, I need to go grab a pen. <laughs> I have one. Do you mind? Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Sorry. Um, I have a back. comment on the image. Um, okay, let me say it occurred to me, which is, is it possible to put windows in the stairwells? Um, and that might make those towers look a little more, um, I don't know, much less foreboding. Yes, of course. That's what uh, actually the St. Albans garage is actually it's all glass. Yeah. The stairwells are glass, completely, so you can see in the walls. Wow. The, the stairwells. I think yeah. it's a safety yeah. thing too. I want to know if anybody's in the stairwells yeah. when I'm. I just don't. Know. Begrudgingly walking to my car in a parking garage. Um, <laughs> Sorry, so uh, it was the idea there that we could maybe use glass instead of uh, glass as the the solid surface there? Well, my idea was to stick windows in it, yeah. Um, yeah. but that's another idea is to make it them make them glass. glass towers. Okay. And presumably, you don't need to do every tower the same, too. We could. Yeah, this should maybe some oh, rose colored sorry. glass. <laughs> um, okay, but <laughs> at least some kind of windows or glass. In the, the stairways. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, making a list here of things that we can maybe make some decisions about. Uh, as yes, as we add these things, we could end up with a really odd cookie cutter look. So uh, we can put out some ideas, and maybe you can come back with more than one rendition. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, not, if you have glass, we're talking than, about art, and we have plans. Suddenly, right. you've got a whole lot of stuff. That's my committee is stuff. Have we met yes. on it? That yeah. would work well for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think if we, I think if we make a list and give it to you, uh, yeah. we can depend on you for relatively cohesive versions from our... Right. We'll, we'll Even if they're not at this same, level. We'll apply yeah. the same kind of rigor we would to any design. We're going to be looking for yeah. Yeah. Which ones are really things to tie it together yeah. and make it make sense. Um, I just also want to um, just restate that whatever it is that we do, I mean, sure, this is going to increase or decrease costs yes. marginally, right? Um, but, I, you know, if any one of these things kicks us substantially over like that, is that's a big flag for me. So. Uh, the, the only piece of that is, is, is that you know, I think you, you're thinking if you're going to have significant public art, you should have some kind of budget for that, a line item for it. I agree. That might be something yeah, separately it considered. Be <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it should be part of the plan. It should be, you know, it shouldn't be the afterthought. But I think that's how we keep it from taking over your budget is we, is we uh, set aside a line item for that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so, I'm going to start with things that I feel like might have the most consensus and go towards the least consensus, maybe? Just sure. It's a guess, and if I leave anything off the list, or, you know, dear public, if you think of other things that we should consider, um, certainly welcome that. Uh, so, uh, thinking about the the roof line of the guard tower. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, no, Can no, we no. not call it that? The tower. The tower. The tower. The, tower. the, tower. the, tower. Yes. the roof line of the tower. Thank you. Um, articulation should be number one because it's in zoning. Oh, what now? Articulation should be number articulation. one because it's in zoning. Yes, so and that might be able to be achieved through um, the tower roof or something. Well, or structure. Let's read what the regs say. And okay. Require. Okay. So we're all okay with like doing something different with that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, what do we think about the possibility of adding windows and/or glass to the stairways? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Um, 
uh, how about the at least the option for adding public art? And I, I want to say that with the, the caveat of it might not be the first. Like that might, this might take a while. Yeah. But sure. this is something of interest? OK. Uh, great. Uh, having some portion of the walls be green. Yes, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. OK, great. Um, awesome. Uh, so one thing, oh, um, the, the question about brick versus cement, um, I think, is a tricky one, maybe. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean. I like brick. I happen to like brick. I happen to like brick. <laughs> I like brick. <laughs> you don't know. It's okay. You can. It's okay. It's not numbers. <laughs> I, I think that, for instance, uh, there are uh, parts of the bank that we were talking about earlier. I don't bankers. Yeah. I don't remember. People's United. People's United. Mm -hmm. um, that I do like, uh, and some of those those uh, arch structures are cool. There is one section that I think is weird looking because it's, <laughs> it's two little arches <laughs> with, with a, 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 a steel or something structure underneath those two arches. Like he's not going to install one of the columns over there. Exactly. It looks like somebody stole a column. Yeah. And, and so I just want to be careful about things like that. OK. That, that, that uh, if, it, if, you, if you make it look like the brick is structural in an arch, then you should not break that illusion uh, in some part of the building. That's then all. I so appreciate it. I, I agree. Um, uh, other thoughts about brick? I mean, it makes people talk, so maybe it, <laughs> maybe it fulfilled its purpose. Um, I'm mostly pro brick, yeah. Okay. Pro brick. I just want to. I just received another note from a constituent, um, just making sure that there are like ample mirrors in the stairways as well, so you can sort of see what's going on in there. Oh, just, yeah. just. It's a safety mm, mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. That's a good call. Yeah, I got the same message, so yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, We're planning on having, like, emergency help part? phones in the yes. stairwells as well. OK. Yeah. I, I think this was a non-issue, because you said we were going to do it anyway, but um, the inclusion of granite in um, some of that, I think. And we should feature that, actually. I mean, if we're going to put granite in there, we should mm -hmm. say what quarry it yeah, came from, great. and I just make yeah. it reflect our area. I love it. It's going to be local granite, right? Yeah, <laughs> just checking. coming from China. <laughs> just checking. Um, now, you the, in trouble. we, we did yeah. sort of just talk about this, but I had it on my list really. separately, um, was the possibility of arches. And I, I think if they're done well, they would be yeah. amazing. I love arches. Didn't I the like golden arches, arches get run out of town here a few years ago? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> if only they were golden. They should have been for editor. Maybe they should have been brick. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> now they're actually have brick McDonald's. Uh, other <laughs> thoughts on arches? Sure, yeah. OK. You all laugh. The, I was part of that. The more like non, uh, non-linear elements it make, makes me really happy. Uh, okay, that was everything that I had on my list. Um, we also talked about patterns in the brick. Oh, yeah, patterns in the brick. Thoughts? Yeah. yeah. Again, how much? How much of these, where they all go? Um, I just think it, as long as we just make sure to be mindful of what the zoning requires, then, yeah. yeah. I have a little bit of hesitation about patterns in the brick, which is because I feel like it could go badly, <laughs> quickly, I don't know. <laughs> well, what I think about when you mentioned patterns in the brick is, one, the steeple of the church downtown that has the oh, patterns on the, the, uh, on the mm -hmm. uh, slate. The slate, yeah. And, and, and each uh, section is different. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there was, uh, the building doesn't exist anymore, but there used to be a restaurant off I-89 down in Richmond, I think, called the Checkerboard Restaurant. Oh, it's used still to be off, Is it? Yeah. Okay. But you see, the, it's called that because there's, the it's built in it with a checkerboard pattern on the brick. It's, Fle it's a Flemish pond brick. Yeah, it's one of the oldest houses in Vermont. Hmm. It's a good restaurant. Yeah. Hmm. Is it still a restaurant? Yeah, I can't afford huh? to eat there, but. Oh. <laughs> all yeah. the time, not all you know, the time. it's uh, yeah. I suppose that. You see it over to the right. I could be. I I could I could get on board. 
we have might patterns need convincing in the brain. on that one. I'm, I might need some convincing, but I... Let's get a periodic chart of elements. Oh my gosh, there you go. Or some physics. We're going to put the periodic table in bridge. Your shirt on the... Yeah, there you go. Can we, can we put, you know, <laughs> nice. the, the uh, bubble to the uh, bubble chamber tracks of subatomic particles? Oh, okay. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else? Okay. Steve. I hate to break up the phone. So, okay. Uh, the, I was at the development review board meeting a couple nights ago. Uh, in the issue of advocacy developer versus regulator, uh, it became clear that the development review board, that it's going to be the city's public works department that decides how much of a traffic study we need. And that's a very untenable position to put Tom in, who answers to Bill, to answers to the council. Uh, because the trip generation analyses that were done for the both phases of the Bashar project do not come anywhere close to the definition of a traffic study. Uh, traffic study done on number of turns left, right, time of day, through which egress and out, that needs to be done. And y'all need to take it, make a firm commitment to do that. But I believe where you're going to come out is that the 20 foot easements across Bashar's property are going to be inadequate, especially dumping onto State Street uh, without traffic control. And I suspect where you're going to come out is not where you want to come out, but you're going to come out with Haney Lot access and potentially the need to use them in a domain and make the Haney Lot a street connecting to L and a traffic lot, you know, to accommodate the level of traffic and the ingress and egress and public safety. And you really need to recognize that that's a possibility here and consider it in, in these discussions because that's a very political thing and you don't want to come back later with a bait and switch that we're going to do that. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, we have to talk to do, do you want to or, I, So we have been talking about a second egress and access. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't talked about it yet tonight. And with, you know, he's in, appreciate Steve's input. Um, I, my direction to Tom was whatever's necessary. Um, you know, we, I've not directed Tom in any way, shape or form to yeah. uh, do any more or less, it's, you know, use your professional judgment, whatever's needed, uh, the same as we would for any other development project of this size in this part of town, and don't ask me to approve it. Yep. Just do it. Yep. Great. Um, okay. Which has also been our instructions to the planning mm -hmm. and zoning department. Um, I know White and Burke did a lot of work for us in terms of thinking through uh, what's normal for parking garages. They've been a, a good third yeah, party yeah, yeah, they're, entity. They're a very active partner in this. Yeah. They're still consulting on this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, was, was there anything further um, that we should be considering? Well, oh, we are talking about the two exits. Two, yes. Yes. Oh. yes but I was, was going to say we didn't talk about, make a decision about the roof. That's true. Nobody I thought we did. Nobody made a motion. Nobody made a motion. But don't we have to? And no. No. There, there was an opportunity to make a motion. She and asked. Not made it, and we she right. asked for What does that translate that to? Means it means that, that there's, there's no, no support. Roof. Nobody made a motion. To, to, add, a, to add a roof. It's not in the base proposal, so yeah. nobody made a motion. Yeah. Yeah. But I would like to talk about the two potential egresses. Exits. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to, I'm going to turn it over to you. So. The instructions when I came in the door were that uh, that the access to and from the garage would be solely from the uh, from the uh, Capitol Plaza property to State Street. Um, there has been some talk about what happens if there's a car stall or something like that. So can you speak up. Okay. Um, you can sit right up here. So. So. Or that you can move that thing closer to you. If you speak closer to it, yeah. So our best, <laughs> yeah. our, best, our best thinking on that right now is, is that at the entrance to the garage itself, we will incorporate three lanes, one to come in, one to go out, and one to be flexible. That would not rearrange the, the I just learned this today from, from uh, the meeting we had at noon. Um, that takes some of the pressure off, 
but there still seems, I, I think there's still a desire to have like a secondary or emergency only use access at the lower level, which would be the Haney lot access. Everything the traffic people have told me is that introducing additional traffic at the intersection of Elm Street is going to be problematic. And that, that by having two egresses, it's a problem. I, I, I think we would, if we provided it, it, would be a, it wouldn't be for regular use. But it would, we're going to have an opening there for flood control purposes. Um, <clears throat> we've been thinking that that opening would be controlled somehow. And if for some <clears throat> reason the main entrance got blocked, somebody at City Hall could open a gate. But that's, I think that's as far as we've gone with that. We don't really want to set up two separate pay stations or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's, yeah. that's the, yeah. that's so the best thing. My suggestion is that we, my suggestion is that we explore the second access to the extent possible, understand the cost. I, I, I think there are safety and traffic reasons. I, I think the, the counterbalancing traffic concerns, and this is what we would need someone else to tell us, is on one hand, you've got two places where people come in on the State Street. The other thing is with traffic management, sometimes dispersal of mm -hmm. location is better, but they still you know, come out at the same place at the Elm. And, None of us are expert enough to, to make that impression. I know, but to me, just for any number of reasons, Steve mentioned it could be an accident. There could be, you know, anything could happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Need to get emergency vehicles in a separate way. I think having a second vehicle access is pref preferable. And if it's feasible, and they're both functioning, pay access is great. If they're not, that's okay too. But I think we should we gotta we gotta run it up the flagpole and make sure that it's you know. Mm -hmm. See if we can do it. That's, I, I was sold on that after visiting the St. Albans. They were pretty clear. They have two separate ac exits, and they're both fully automated, functional pay. And you know, they just said, "Look, sometimes these gates break. These things happen, and people could just go around and go out the other way and still pay. And it's all fine. But you know, it is also additional cost, and we'd have to understand what all that meant." Well, at one time, Elm Street was looked at a possible street to take tra traffic off of State Main Street. Remember when it, we talked about a, a vehicle bridge, not just a pedestrian bridge? Uh, I don't know that any yeah. real serious study was done. But it was a discussion. Right. Yeah. And we would have no issue using the, the, the property for that vehicle access because we have that property at least you know, for the same life as the parking. So. What do you need from us at this point? Well, if you don't want it. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah. yeah. I'd definitely yeah. like to explore it. Yeah. yeah, that's all we really need. Yeah, especially if it's a safety. Keep it in the design for now to find okay. the, whether it's the yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we could, just could come down to a policy statement about how you use it. Like, well, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Ashley, did you, you looked like you were going to say something. No? Okay. Donna. It's related to this topic, so you can tell me, cut me off, but it has to do with using the Elm Street. Uh, 60, 60 State Street lot that takes you out to Elm, which this back access would for a bike lane. Mm -hmm. Mary Hooper particularly brought this up. She couldn't stay, but I wanted to make sure it got stated and that here is State Street and that we consider an actual clearly marked attractive bike lane back here to the path. Would, I wonder if that would require removing parking, or would that be sep like s outset well, I, from and it parking? Just, again, it doesn't have to be decided tonight, but I just wanted to throw yeah. the idea. She feels like this regress is not really bicycle friendly, mm -hmm. and nothing out here, whereas here you could look down and see straight through. Mm -hmm. We could put uh, position like flags extending from the outside of the building to help drive people to the river, mm -hmm. uh, but that was her concern. Bicyclists are here, but how? What's going to draw them into mm -hmm. the path? So, she just, I just want everybody to have that in their brain, Great. and that it got discussed. Yeah. No decision, but something to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was the point that I was trying to make <coughs> true too when I talked about access to the back. And <coughs> I don't have it in my head what address 60 State Street is. That's this. That's, that's, that's this parking lot. That's, that, that's that parking lot. Okay. Yep. Um, just, just to throw up there, I, I, I need guidance from city council, from the city's attorney or whatever. I believe this garage building has some kind of 
right of access down through here. I, mm -hmm. we, we does, doesn't show up on the surveys, but it's been described to me that, that they have an access to that back parking lot. So okay. maybe it's in the land records or something. Something. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be good to get some clarity on that. But um, four square for for improved bike access. Yeah, just something like short term, even that painted green kind of bike path that we're now using. And then maybe we could go to some other kind of pavement later on. Okay. Something that's very distinguished. Okay. Um, uh, gosh, this is, that was one other thing that like uh, is interesting to me, but I don't know what the opportunity is here. I'd really love permeable pavers instead of asphalt. We can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's maybe not this discussion. <laughs> Someone's going to tell me that that's going to cost too much later. Um, in any case, um, I think for the purposes of uh, what we needed to get done tonight, um, we've, we've gotten through it all. We've done it. Uh, okay, so any further questions, comments? No? You're, you're happy? <laughs> I, I, have my, I have my homework. Great. I, no, no, I'm excited. I, yeah. I think there's a lot of room for improvement here, and I'm glad to have some direction on that because, you know, I, I think whether or not you like the idea of a garage, it ought to be the best garage we, we can make. Yeah. And it, and for when, the money we have. When people, when people drive by, they should, they should say, I'm glad we did that. And so... Yes. Maybe functionally we can't make you happy, but artistically we can. You know, so I'm, I'm going to make my I'm going to make that effort. Great. So I really appreciate your time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, Glenn. Appreciate you. Um, just I just want to follow up um, because maybe I kind of missed it in the process, and it doesn't totally feel necessary now. But I feel like I, uh, I understood that we were going to uh, select a couple of specific council members uh, to form a, a sort of ad hoc committee to continue talking about this design and being the, the point people? Is that no longer? Well, that's because that's what this is. That's what this is. That's all what this was going to be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was going to be um, all of us. I mean, that, we, that makes sense. I just want okay. to make sure I Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Cool. Further questions? Okay. I guess without objection. Oh, wait. Uh, the, did we have... Yes, go ahead. Did, yeah, did we have a point for... Council reports, which we usually do, we don't. But I was just going to say one thing, yeah. which is that uh, last week we were scheduling our uh, this week's meeting, and you know we always have our meeting set up on Wednesdays. As it happened, after uh, we left, there were people who couldn't be here last week because of Rosh Hashanah. We rushed to schedule uh, this week this week's meeting for tonight. Yom Kippur, so again, there were people who couldn't be there, and so I just would like us to always try to be uh, aware of those mm -hmm. uh, limitations holidays, when, yeah. uh, when we schedule things. Yeah. And I, I apologize for the role I played in not having a good day covered that. Yes, yeah. likewise. Thank you. Uh, great. So, uh, without objection, we're going to consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. Thank you.